podcast um i'm looking at raghavan and today i am joined by uh professor raj balkran um who is a professor um teaching and actually the curriculum uh del on the curriculum development board at the oxford uh, U- uh center for hindu studies um dr balkran has been um he's also a published author he published uh, a book on devi mahatmyam um in really regards to the narrative structure of the, the text, along with um, uh, larger uh, uh, connections to Puranic uh, narrative uh, frameworks. Um, he does, he's an experienced podcaster, actually. He, he spends uh, quite a bit of his time also doing um, the new books in Hindu studies, which is a, a fantastic podcast. If you haven't watched it or listened to it yet, please go listen to it at any of the uh, podcast uh, apps that you find, which is, you know, Apple, Google, Stitcher, whatever. Um, it's just, it's frankly one of the best podcasts for information, knowledge, and um, really good conversations, actually. Um, so, Professor Balkran, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm fantastic. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Oh, it, it's our pleasure, to be honest. It's been a, it's been a long time coming. There's a, there's a very few people within the space I think that are actually doing consistent podcasts on like Hindu thought or Buddhist thought or, you know, any from, from both a scholarly perspective and practitioner perspective, which I think is kind of lacking in, I mean, I hate to say in the modern world, in many ways, people love the Hindu identity, but have no sense of what uh, the Shastras or text or the tradition or practitioners actually feel and do and, study and and know about so i mean your podcast is fantastic for for those dialogues especially because you deal with uh the new books that are coming out all the time (laughs) indeed indeed so it's uh the new books in hindu studies it's just officially been rebranded yesterday just by chance it's now new books in indian religions yeah and that umbrella affords more space for Sikhism, for Jainism, for Sufism or Islam in India. Uh, Same concept, same host, uh, more space. Yeah, no, and that's fantastic. I I think that's uh, important, um, you know, for, especially when we start thinking about like the syncretic nature of of most of those uh, uh, traditions, right? The the Hindu, Buddhist, Jains, um, you know, they kind of along, they kind of give and take from each other in a much more uh, um, malleable way. I think it's like the wall is there's, very thin. There's a sort of I think of it as an Indic ecosystem, right? Yeah, that's right. That's there's an right. ecosystem there, and they're, they're all offshoots of a certain soil. There's, there's something in the air there. Obviously, there's um, vast differences between Buddhism and Jainism and Sikhism and Hinduism. What we call Hinduism. Yeah. Nevertheless, it's useful to think of them as from the same soil. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there are differences, and you're right. I, I just find myself a lot of times seeing them as so. Those differences are somewhat uh, manufactured in some ways. In some ways, they're real, but because just because so people are so willing to go to practice at a Hindu temple or Buddhist stupa or Jain temple, and vice versa. It just there's this this weird flow of of people going between these things. So I always find that like, it's not such a clear cut distinction sometimes, especially when you get into like, when you start looking at Tantra and then you look at Tantra Buddhism versus uh, Shaivai Tantra, it's so, so much of it is similar. It's a great example. Uh, and even yoga. Yeah, right. that's right. So there, there are these, uh, there are aspects of Indian religion, Indian religiosity that cut across the boundaries of what we think of as these distinct categories. Yeah, um, and, and so, I mean, I don't want to jump into all these conversations just yet because I think they're going to open up naturally. But I want to have a sense of of who you are. Um, you're you're you have a very interesting background, I think, from my understanding. Um, you know, you're you're Indo Caribbean, uh, a, a descent um, who has jumped into the world of academia uh, in Hindu studies. How what is how did that happen? You know, it's a I, I know a lot of uh, Indo Caribbean people, and even though they they 
they're they're Hindus, it's very rare to see many of them enter into the academic realm for Hindu studies, particularly. Well, um, if you're looking for a sense of how I got where I got, good luck, because I'm still trying to sort that out. <laughs> Never, <laughs> nevertheless, um, no, I, I muse at you know how any of this is happening. Nevertheless. Um, are you asking about my academic path, how I took this? I mean, route? academic, personal, all connect, right? You know, at some point, like, yeah. what, how did you, how did you first, how, like growing up, how, what was your interaction with Hinduism and, and like, what's your family background in that regard? Yeah, so uh, I sort of, maybe the best place to start is by saying that um, for much of my life, for most of my life, um, uh, I really see myself as watching life, huh. very much an outsider looking on. And um, at one point that was um, dissettling, unsettling, uh, dissettling, I just made up a word, unsettling <laughs> or, dis or disturbing, <laughs> um, um, disconcerting, I think is the word I was thinking of. Sure. But now I find it a great boon. And so the various um, identities that people adopt whether it's nationality or ethnicity or religion or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it took me some time to realize really through the study of, of Hindu philosophy that, that this feeling that I had that these were just as garments, right? Uh -huh. That they weren't really who you are. That's sort of a sense that I always had, but sort of, I, you know, I landed in Toronto at the age of three Right. So Toronto has been my home since. And so in terms of my social conditioning, I'm more Canadian than anything else. But I had a Hindu backdrop. Right. There was an Indo-Caribbean Hindu backdrop, um, not a particularly religious home by any stretch. Uh -huh. But nevertheless, you know, all Hindus know what Diwali is. All Hindus may have a, a Murtis in their home, um, etc. And so growing up in Toronto, I, I inwardly really struggled because I was a different color, a different religion, and it was a, a deep sort of gash. You know, in addition to all that people have to struggle with, mm -hmm. even if you are the same gender, color, orientation as everyone else, you're still sort of struggling to find your identity and fit in. Um, but sort of uh, the, the ways in which I felt as an outsider in every room that was just heightened over the years. And it, it actually forced me to look inward and find out who I am yeah. and come to terms with accepting myself versus trying to now go be Guyanese or be Hindu or be ex whatever the situation is, be on the chess club or be whatever, yeah. the music nerd. Um, but nevertheless, these pieces are crucial. So there is an, there's an Indo uh, uh, Caribbean backdrop. Yeah. There's a, a Canadian upbringing. And then there, for most of my, my sort of, say, grade school, public school education, there was a very rationalist brain and a deeply spiritual philosophical soul. Yeah. So uh, I've been blessed with wisdom. Some yeah. days it works, some days it doesn't. <laughs> right? I'd like to think I've learned a thing or two from the School of Hard Knocks this time around, but nevertheless, um, there's an, there was an endowment there, you know, there was an endowment there at birth. Um, and anyhow, going through and, and, and trying to process living in the world, living in the Western world, living so alienated from everything. Yeah. Um, there are many challenges, there are many hurdles to overcome. Sure. Uh, I found myself at the age of, I had intelligence as well, or so my grades say anyhow, but at the age of 22, uh, I enrolled in, after high school, I enrolled uh, at the University of Toronto, Victoria College, to do a BA in literature, English literature. I loved language. I love narrative. Sure. Surprise, surprise. And uh, after two years, I dropped out of school. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I dropped out of school because uh, so said the so said the thought yeah. that I was I wasn't. Some people can do uh, university. Some people can't. I'm just not cut up for it. Right. Right. Uh, I just, uh, you know, I just, it's beyond me and I'm going to go and I worked and I had a wonderful uh, uh, white collar job. I call it monkey work, sort of office monkey work. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, in my brain, I thought I made it. Yeah, yeah. I, hail I hail from indentured labor. 
you know, ultimately, right. blue collar immigrant family growing up. Yeah. I'm like, great, I've got this white collar job. I'm fine. I'm good. But the idea that um, I couldn't do it or that I wasn't cut out for it, really what that thought was, that thought was masking an emotion that you're not worthy of this. Sure. Nobody in your line has ever gone beyond high school. Who do you think you are? How dare you do this? You can't do this. It's not for you. Sure. Unconscious, right? Not conscious. Right, right. So I dropped out. <laughs> and I worked doing office monkey work for a couple of years. And then I had this manager, this, this lovely manager, who said to me, you know what, Raj? We have a job that pays double what you're making now. And we can't even interview you for the job because the job requires post-secondary education. And we don't care if it's in Greek pottery. You really should finish something, <laughs> finish a degree. This will hold you back for the rest of your life, wherever you go. Sure. And um, all right, I took her counsel to heart. And so I thought, okay, you know what? I'm going to go back and, and study. Of course, I was afraid because I was old, because I was like, you know, 24 or something. And everybody else was like, maybe 20, 21. I uh, thought, okay, I'm going to go back. I don't care about the career planning. I don't care about the degree. I don't care about the registrar. I just, let me find one course that I can really enjoy because I know if my heart's in it, yeah. I'll show up, I'll finish, and I'll figure out the rest. Right. When I started the English literature degree, my dream job was to be a, a high school teacher uh -huh. and work my way up to board education at the Toronto District School Board. That was my dream job. Yeah. Um, so there are these pieces, literature, narrative, teaching, you know, they're all sort of, these pieces are there. So I ended up um, thinking, what am I going to take? What am I going to take? I have this course book, crossing out, you know, chemistry, crossing out biology, crossing out, you know, history. I had enough of that. You know, I'm like, what am I going to do? So this was the first Thursday in 2004, first Thursday in September, 2004. And it was the first day that the University of Toronto was starting their courses and I still hadn't decided. So I decided I'll take the book home this weekend and I'll decide and next week I'll start my class. So I'm sitting there over my lunch hour from oh. my desk job in my dentist chair because I was one of these people who had like a full day's work, a, a dental appointment in his lunch hour and then a catering shift. I did cater waitering in, in those years as well. I was one of these people, right? I think I still am in certain ways. Um, in my dentist chair, I'm flipping through. And then introduction to Hindu religious tradition. OMG, they teach Hinduism at the University of Toronto? <laughs> what is this? Obviously, I knew they weren't going to do puja or give you diksha sure. or anything like that. Sure. But I'm like, wow, they teach about Hinduism at the University of Toronto. I didn't even know religious studies was a discipline. Wow. I didn't even know that. So I'm like, okay, great. I'm, I'll enroll in this because it was a point in my life when I was uh, becoming more spiritual, sure. more actively spiritual. I was getting up in the morning, starting meditation, and I really, I was really thirsty. Okay. Right. And so I'm like, great. I could learn about Hinduism, figure out which practices are for me, and not figure out the truth about Hinduism. <laughs> right. Right. Um. And okay, great. So when does the when does the course start? It starts today. Holy crap, I can't do this course. I have a shift tonight. Yeah. I called the catering office and they're always, always like, you know, numbers fluctuate. So they're always looking for people last minute. It's 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 the party planning scene. So sure, they're, sure. you know, so I, uh, you know, and I was terribly responsible. So I would never want to cancel a shift or call in sick. So I call them just to kind of put my feelers out. The owner answers, Hey, hey Raj, yeah, hi. And he says to me, Do you want tonight off? And they say, what do you mean do I want tonight off? You guys are always looking for people. We have extras booked tonight. You want tonight off? Uh, yeah, actually. Okay, so now I'm convinced that there's some divine intervention going on here. I'm like, okay. I show up at the class. Uh, I loved it. I stayed for that whole year. It's the highest mark I ever got in university. And then after that one year, I took severance from the company, went back to school, finished my BA. I had two more years left to finish my BA then did a master's part-time over three years on the Valmiki Ramayana, then worked again for a year, then did a PhD at the University of Calgary from 2011 to 2014, 2015. Huh. And uh, I've been living the life of, uh, <laughs> of, a, of, 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 of a, a self-employed scholar and online educator since then. So that gives you maybe a little bit of a taste of the academic path. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I think that's really interesting. I mean, uh, if I can, I would l- I'd love to jump into parts of this. Um, you know, it, it, it is, um, it's a very sad situation, I think, amongst a lot of uh, the diaspora that much of the Indo-Caribbean community is kind of sidelined from the larger Hindu or Indian uh "Quote unquote brotherhood that we have, or sisterhood, whatever you want to call it, they're they're not really included as well. Um, and I think there's like a lot of experiences from th- that community that that are so relevant to to us understanding how Hinduism ch- changes over over you know time and location, right? Because the way the Indo in the Indo Caribbean um, practice of Hinduism has changed very much so from the way it's practiced in India, because um, it's integrated a lot of the Know, elements from the Caribbean region, from African uh, traditions. Um, I mean, do you was your family in that sense kind of connected to any of that? Connected to like like the the religion that was practiced by the Indo Caribbeans, like Hinduism on the on the ground, whether it was Guyana or Trinidad or whatever. Yeah, so it definitely came from a Hindu home. There was a shrine in the home. Mm-hmm. We observed holidays such as Diwali or Holi. Um, as you know, in the West Indies, it's it's obviously more North Indian culture. Sure. Um, but yeah, well, it definitely came from a Hindu home, but th- there wasn't anyone who was particularly religious. In much the same way as many people come from a Roman Catholic home yeah. and may observe certain holidays. So that was definitely part of my background. But growing up, I, you know, I wished I was like a skinny white kid named Matt Andrews or something, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? And, and, and so it's, it, this is just a reality. It took me a long time to overcome the various ways in which you feel um, that you're an outsider. And most of that is because you are demographically in many ways. Yeah. Um, and really <laughs> look what I end up doing. I mean, owning who I am and owning my spirituality, owning my heritage, it actually ended up being the very thing that I'm called to do with my life. Right. Not for the purpose of activism. Right. For me, I see activism as happening, happening as um, it's a side effect of just being who you are. Sure. And showing up in the world. Right. But uh, but yeah, there are lots of pieces to the puzzle. But I was more or less a, <laughs> a Westerner in brown skin who discovered he had a very Indian soul and then ended up studying uh, and, uh, Hinduism at the university and also receiving a number of initiations with masters and practicing. And so there are all these pieces, right? Right. I mean, that's, I mean, and to me, it's, it's, I mean, it's different for me because I grew up in a, my, my dad is rather religious, right? You know, so um, he, from a young age, I think the first, gosh, the first thing I was reading was like Amr Chitra Kataz, you know, with uh, the you know, Dashavatar or whatever it is, you know, and I was, you know, like when I was a kid, I couldn't say certain you no, know, you can't say certain still be like Matya, Kudma, you know, like I, that was like the first things I learned. Um, and then so learning that, learning slokas and stotras, you know, it was, it was a, in some ways, I think during my teenage years, I got turned away from religion because of the, the very overwhelming nature of religion that was presented to me by my father. Um, but as you age, you know, it's, it's weird. I think like in, in my later 20s and then 30s, I really got, um, a lot out of what my dad had taught me and I started to understand these things because I think a large part of our parents generation um did not understand how to convey ideas that were were embedded within our 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 stotras or texts or whatever it is and I think like having people now like you coming through who are able to talk about a certain practice or a certain idea in a, in a way that's like beautiful to be honest right it 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 really conveys this 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 deep rationality and deep mystical spiritual experience that goes into a particular text or a particular stotra whatever it is and i think that's you know that's something that our generation lacked and so many ways maybe that's why like i in similar like you were i you know i wanted to be someone else for a long time you want to be like you know, not, not you, you don't want to be the brown skin, only brown skin guy that's, you know, vegetarian, non, you know, worships apparently a cow eats monkey brains. Um, you know, <laughs> it's just such a weird world growing up in, you know, 
in America or, or Canada in the in the eighties when you're not really part of mainstream at all or at, in any stream, to be honest. No, there's so so much in what you say. One of the most healing experiences. There were a number of them. But when I started coaching people one on one, even long before I started doing it formally. Yeah. It sort of it was a way of life since about probably middle school, high school for sure. People would come for sometimes practical help like math help um, yeah. or they'd come because they were having a relationship issue or they're upset because mom and dad is like this or whatever it is. But it was deeply healing for me to meet people with issues I was able to help. When I yeah. look at them, they're uh, straight, white, Christian, in shape dudes who speak English and are able bodied. They're the face of our culture. Yeah. And yet it was profound for me to learn how alienated some of them felt the ones yeah. who needed the help, how much of an outsider they may have felt because maybe they weren't the jock or maybe X, Y, Z, P, Q, whatever. Yeah. And it really taught me that that feeling of alienation and being an outsider, it's not necessarily manifest in something tangible or visible to others, but that is the malaise of our age. No yeah. one feels that they belong. Everyone's trying to find home and they're doing it in different ways. Some ways are functional, some ways not so much. But this deep sense of not belonging is perennial in our times. Um, there's, there's also obvious, obviously there are great examples of community and the power of community sure. and the power of a collective, whether based on religion or based on um, um, interests or whatever it is. Um, uh, if I can go back to your parents for a second, yeah, yeah. Or, or the parents or whoever we want to, as representative somehow of a generation of diasporic yeah. brown people. Um, <laughs> We're all the same, right? I mean, that, that's... <laughs> no, yeah, of course. Of course. Of course. No, what I mean to say is, to me, I see a number of challenges there. There's the challenge of believing everything you know and starting life in a different country. Yeah different culture, different language, sometimes different religion, and then raising kids and then being caught between wanting to, to not see your culture extinguished before your eyes and understanding that they're not there. Your kids are Canadian or they are American. They're also that. Yeah. So there's that challenge, that rift. But beyond that, if you take all that away, Hinduism is next to impossible to teach. And I say that as someone who teaches Hinduism day in and day out. Okay. My favorite analogy is that it's a jungle. Uh, I have three analogies that I use often. It's a jungle. <laughs> okay. Right? Yeah. It's an ecosystem. It, the, clearly, you know this. It was a, the, 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 the umbrella, it, the, the term is an umbrella for everything that's happening in the South Asian continent, India, yeah. civilization, India, that isn't an Abrahamic religion or Sikhism or Jainism or, or Buddhism. Yeah. So it's referring to everything else. And so one doesn't, it is the backdrop. It's something that's lived. It's, right. it's, it's an ethos. It's a culture. There are elements thereof, but it's difficult to convey the sense of a jungle or, right. or talk about how to define the jungle. Um, and, and so there, there, there are a lot of challenges dealing with, with um, Hindu scriptures, right? Yeah, so so can I press on that for a sec? Because uh, I think that's actually an interesting point. Because do you think that is because for I mean, there's there's two ways to think about this. One is because we've we're adhering to a term that was kind of thrown thrown a, a, a cacophony of different practices traditions that may seem connected and they just added a term so that's why it's like this jungle or is it do you actually think the nature of what we now term to be hinduism to have been that jungle right i, I mean it, it's a well one i guess is a construction what the other one is a natural um nature i mean a, a natural nature I mean, a, a natural like um growth of what the the the, the foundation of something is i guess there is a profound diversity um, across what we may call a, a Indian religion. You may have a Vedantin who's not so keen on the Bhakta yeah. and their practices and vice versa. You may have um, 
sectarian divides between Shaivas and Vaishnavas. You may have tantric practices that may be too left-handed to be integrated. You may have tantric practices that have been appropriated now by the Vedic priests, such as the Nyasas or the Paranapatishya of the Murti. And so, A, there is a luscious and dizzying diversity at play. Mm-hmm. B, it's a moving target. Things change in time. And if you're looking, if you're looking to different strata of this archaeological dig, there people struggle with the with the complexity of, of, of data and they struggle with the, the dynamism over time. Yeah. You're yeah. looking at if one was to say, oh, wow, I just want to learn everything I can about Native American religion. Mm-hmm. How many tribes are there or have there been? How many schisms have there been within each tribe? How have they changed over time? Sure. Right. And so so it, it, Hinduism isn't a thing. Hinduism is a, a, a group of things. It's an ecosystem. Right. Right. So then how do you end up teaching it? <laughs> well, because it's used as a word at the modern Western Academy. Okay. So there are courses in Hinduism. There are, there are people who identify as Hindus. Right. When you teach world religions, if you're asking why it's, I mean, we can't undo the fact that it's no, not no, used no, as a I, word. I, the, no, what I mean is, I guess I should have better phrase it, is then if there's almost this, it's just so, such a diverse and, and like a jungle ecosystem, what are the essentials that one can teach if there are any that that well, you can reduce it, down to Hinduism? You know, like like think, like when Christianity, you can say, you know, uh, this is these are the doctrines. If you believe this, you're Christian. How do you do that with Hinduism? Right. So it's it's it is clearly there's diversity and dynamism in in, in all the world's religions. Yeah. But nevertheless, when one teaches world religions as a class, however artificial enterprise that is. Um, it's it's much more straightforward teaching Christianity and Islam. Right. Right? Not so much with Hinduism, because there's a founder, a central right. doctrine, and, and sort of a breaking away from what was before and saying this is what it is now. Whereas with Hinduism, it's the opposite direction. We'll take that too, we'll take that too, we'll take that too, we'll take that too. There's a syncretism at play. Right. right? And so um, rather than teach Hinduism, is it a course on philosophy? Is it a course on caste? Uh, is someone interested in ritual? Is someone interested in uh, nationalism? Uh, is someone interested in Ayurveda? Is someone yeah. interested in, right? So which, so when you're in the jungle, am I looking at elephants? Am I looking at the flight patterns of birds? Am I looking at the viscosity of the sap of this, this tree at this time of year? Am oh. I looking at the insects? What is my interest within the jungle? Right, right. And that will be very clear. Uh, having said that, you can't be totally ignorant of the rest of the ecosystem to make sense of what you're looking at. Right. And so very telling exchange. I, um, I teach private courses online and I had a student in one of my courses. Actually, no, she was a student at the OCHS at the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies where I also teach. And she says, she says, you know, um, she says, Dr. Raj, I really want you to create an intro Hinduism course. Yeah. This was just last month, mind you. And I said, why on earth? I'm thinking to myself, intelligent woman, much like yourself. She's of South Asian descent. Mm-hmm. She's um, uh, Western training, Western bent mentally. And she's been studying for the last, I believe, five, seven years, various courses at OCHS and other platforms. And she goes, will you create an intro Hinduism course? I said, A, wouldn't an intro Hinduism course be beyond you? A, coming from an Hindu home, but even forget that piece. Yeah. You've taken all these advanced Hindu courses already, more advanced Hindu courses. And B, that was my first thought. My second thought was, why would there, there are a number of platforms where you can get an intro Hinduism course. Right. And what she said, she, she said, I want you to create one because I know if you create one, I can make sense of the jungle. And after all these courses, I've learned different aspects of Hinduism, but I don't know how to put them all together. Mm. And so I thought about it and I thought, you know what? This should, I'm sure she's not the only one. So then I created a course 
uh, over the holidays called the Hindu tapestry. That's another of my favorite analogies. One is as a jungle. Right. Yeah, there's a tapestry. A tapestry has various strands, right? And the design is more than the sum of its parts. But right. understanding the strands is useful, right? Right. And so I thought, okay, well, let me let me create a course to convey the way in which I think of Hinduism now. Right. And so I, what I do is I just convey the essential strands of the tapestry. Compartmentalize. Look at the Vedic sacrificial strand. Great. Forget that. Compartmentalize. Don't completely forget it, obviously. Look at the philosophical Vedantic strand. Right. Compartmentalize. Look at the devotional Bhakti strand. Right. Again, look at the tantric alchemical strand, if you will. Sure. Um, 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 and then look at how they come together. Right. Right. If you want a more holistic vision, or if you're looking at a specific practice, like a puja, understand which elements come from the Vedic strand and Vedic ethos. It's a fire ritual, but it's a fire ritual uh, where someone may be singing a bhajan to the Devi in front of a murti. Right. You see, and maybe the Yajamana wants um, some fruit, right? Um, and maybe the priest is using some tantric techniques, as I mentioned before, like nyasa. And you see there are all these elements that have been folded in. It's a syncretic soil. Sure, sure. It's not a, now we're going to, it's not a, okay, now this is how um, Christianity is different from Judaism. This is how Islam is different from both. This is how Sikhism is different from the rest. This is, right? And so I think the challenge is that it's, it's, it's a backdrop religion as opposed to something that emerges from the backdrop. I see. Okay. Okay. I mean, both those analogies are very, they work very well. I think they, they convey the, the unity and the diversity of the, of the practices or the, or the, even the ideas, but, but I mean, in, in, in some ways, right. This is also what our, a lot of the texts do too, right. They, they, they are like, when I read the Mahabharata, for example, and we'll get more into the, the, the text themselves. It's just, I feel like it's a codex. There's it's just layered upon layered upon layer like like even the, the names of the characters mean something in relationship to what they represent to relationship to something the story something to the Vedic past to the to some sort of tantric work there also it just it's every text feels like it's this this like matrix of like ideas that all connect to each other I don't know definitely the texts. Because Hinduism is so syncretic, the texts that survive, that last, that that enjoy longevity, right. are the texts that are most complex because they preserve the very syncretism that the culture is comprised of. Right. Right. So the Mahabharata is absolutely foundational. If ever in history there was a thing called Hinduism that was born, it was born during the churning of the Mahabharata. Yeah. Yeah, I, I the, Ma that. the Mahabharata is basically saying it's the bedrock of what we think of as as Hinduism. Because what's the Mahabharata's project? The Mahabharata, well, you know, you have a very different ethos in Vedic religion, right? And you have a very very different ethos in Vedantic or Upanishadic religion, right? And the Mahabharata's job is to integrate those great yogic, ascetic, otherworldly ideals. But no, 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 don't fully renounce. We have to domesticate them and we need the Vedic platform and we need caste and we need the fire rituals. And, you know, and so the Mahabharata is reconciling. Right, right. Or preserving tensions. Right. And that line about what is, what is, uh, um, what is here, uh, what is here. What is found here can be found elsewhere, but what is not found here could be found Is here. nowhere at all. And the reason why it's in the first and last book is because it's framing the whole Mahabharata, that idea. Yeah, yeah. They repeat it twice. It's framing. That idea cradles the Mahabharata. They're like, look, we are a cultural encyclopedia. Yeah. And we are doing our best to patch together various ideals um, and, and really uh, uh, crystallize um, um, Brahmanic ideology. Uh, that has to integrate ascetic ideals, whereas right. in other traditions, ascetic ideals threaten the very existence of Brahmanism. 
Buddhism, Jainism, great examples. Right? Right. So the Mahabharata is saying, let's find a way to fold it all in. Let's find a grand vision, vision of, of Dharma or ethics or morals. And um, let's, let's, let's Trojan horse various uh, discursive materials, but not without great care and consciousness about what is placed where in whose mouth in whose ears and why right 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 so so jumping off this to your kind of your key research area is narratives right so you spent a lot of time on narratives within not only the the mahabharata uh but very uh, i mean puranas generally so how did you get into wanting to make this the particular study that you wanted to kind of become an expert at to be you know well, I discovered inter Hinduism the day it started, and it pulled me back into school. So I'm like, okay, well, obviously I have to study religion, Hinduism. So I did a degree in religion. I studied a great deal of Hinduism then. I took Sanskrit classes for the rest of my undergrad, undergrad 2.0. And, uh, and then um, I think it was my final year. Uh, I had a course on the Ramayana with Arti Dhand, who, by the way, has a fantastic Mahabharata podcast that you have to check out. Um, 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 and not just because they helped her set it up. She's a fantastic storyteller. <laughs> I get no kickback from that at all. Um, but I took a course with her uh, on, on the Ramayana, the Valmiki uh-huh. Ramayana. And um, I, I, my first love is English literature, right? I love sure. narrative. I love stories. It's how I understand people's lives. It's how I understand culture. My brain is a story brain, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I was so gripped by... Rama in and this whole deal with how how passively and and stoically he he accepts exile on his coronation day my synapses were on fire because I knew this was extraordinarily important archetypally for Hindu culture and maybe even universally and I wanted to make sense of why on earth would you know the center of polity of society on the day where you should be enshrined as a center thereof, should now say, okay, dad, no problem. You made a promise. I'm going to just take those bark, you know, jeans and, you know, I'm going to eat nuts and fruits and, you know, we're not going to procreate for 14 years. So clearly they're chaste, right? We're going to live like yogis now Bye, all the best. So this, this, I couldn't shake the need to understand what the hell was going on there. Right. <laughs> And so my, uh, the following year, I, I, uh, I undertook, a, I began a, a master's on the Valmiki Ramayana, trying to understand what the hell was going on there. And, um, and there were two parts of the master's that ended up in two different journal articles over the years. One was uh, 2012 Journal of the American Academy of Religion, violence in the Valmiki Ramayana, saying violence is fully justified. Mm-hmm. I worked with Dr. Walter Dorn at the Canadian College of the Armed Forces. He does defense studies okay. and he's, he's big on just war theory, right? Right. And so we looked at just war theory and we were like, whoa, the Valmiki Ramayana validates all of the criteria of just war theory, but it's in the narrative. It's in the plot. It's in the, 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 the diatribes. Sure. So this is what I show. Violence is fully legitimized. But the last piece of the thesis, which I think was my favorite, was that violence is never fully legitimized. <laughs> They're never fully okay with it. Right. There, it, there's a major problem. So yes, let's let's legitimize the the bloodshed um, uh, of the the warrior and the king. But let's also say that bloodshed's never really okay. Yeah. And so that famous scene where where Rama kills uh, Valin from hiding. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he uses a justification, oh, well, we're allowed to hunt. And you know that's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the author, Valmiki or whomever, is saying, what's the difference between the, the warrior and the hunter? Look what justification he's using. But it, 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 just on that point, I, I mean, I hate, I hate to interrupt you, but I, it's like something I can't let go because it's, it's so beautiful, right? Because Rama goes through all these defenses and Vali just shoots them down. And then he, and then Rama's final response is, "Well, you're an animal," and and then there's no there's no response to, to 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 make you feel whole about it. It, 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 it because, leaves you hanging with that. The, the, because that is precisely the intention of the text. Yeah. To rehearse the justifications of violence as we need to. Yeah. But show you 
whether you're a king or whether you're a hunter, in the name of Ahimsa, you're going to hell. Yeah. I'm speaking, you no, know, no, right? No. I'm speaking metaphorically. This is how I teach, right? Like, it doesn't matter. There's this sort of um, uh, categorical values of all time and space. This is, I, I, this is ascetic idealism, right? Yeah. Nonviolence, nonviolence, nonviolence. Look at you. You're, you're killing him from hunting. Another really, really important clue very important clue is the whole bija of the text where Valmiki births verse. Yeah. Shoka he birth, but he births it how? Because he's so piteous over the violence of the hunter. Yeah. He's cursing violence. The Valmiki Ramayana has a subversive but important curse to violence. Yeah. Encoded throughout. And 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 renders the state dystopic. Rama's never happy there. He has to give up his wife. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so that that problematization is held in tandem with the valorization of the state and the warrior's duty. It's it's purposefully preserving a paradox. Why? Because life is paradoxical. You yeah. cannot have a logical resolution. Life is messy. Yeah, and in the epics, they do that bar none, and I think why they're afforded the opportunity to do that is because they 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 merge um, on the backs of these two very divergent ethoses, the Vedic and the Upanishadic, and to reconcile them is more than just reconciling Hinduism or or or, or safeguarding Brahmanism from 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 you know, um, it's it's reconciling something about the human experience. Right, right. Concerns of the inner. And the concerns of the outer, right? Right. No, no, I, 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 I totally agree here because I, uh, uh, you know, the the story of Almiki and and uh, the two two birds being shot by the hunter is very much emulated in the Mahabharata with Pandu's killing of the and the, and the two deer, right? You know, and that and the story both takes off in many ways from that one incident, right? Is where where the Valmiki creates. Poetry, Kavya, with the with this sorrow, we he shouts out and sings, um, and and Pandus creates basically the conundrum at the heart of the Mahabharata, which is the the legalese of are these actually my children? Are we all bastards? You know, I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a beautiful dichotomy here because it sits there that I think both both the texts I think are ultimately right. They both abhor violence, a violence at the heart of of this is wrong. Ahimsa paramo dadma, you know, that goes into many times ahimsa paramo yajna, all this other stuff, right, in the Mahabharata. But the beauty I think it comes down to is what it's saying is ultimately karma here is the ultimate uh, reason why violence is terrible. Because there's every action, even if your intent is good, creates some response. And even if you kill because you as a king have to kill, there's some, even though the text say sometimes you have no, no sin is incurred, none of this is incurred, it's there. It's still present throughout the entire uh, uh, under undertone of, all, of it all. So I, I think karma becomes like this, this underlying power that energizes why even nonviolence is better than violence. But, you know, yeah, I mean, that's just a thought. So, so I think that's true in insofar as karma or this idea that we had there are consequences, yeah. metaphysical consequences. This comes from the the Upanishadic or sure. Vedantic worldview, right? And this needs to be integrated into the fact that we need violence to survive. We need yeah, violence 100%. to eat. We need violence to protect our state. We need violence to enforce the law. The pragmatism of violence cannot be dispensed with. So I think the plot thickens in that the text abhors violence and the text fully legitimizes violence. And that's why at every turn, the Mahabharata has to goad and and and, and assure Yudhishthira that it's okay, they're there, dear. You're allowed to be a king. Please go be a king. You're not a yogi. You're not a sage. Yeah. And this is why Krishna comes up with this profound, profound reconciliation and says, you know, be a sage with your, your your head and your heart, be a soldier with your hands and your feet. Do both. Yeah, this comes the profound, but he needs to come up with the reconciliation because the text can't be allowed to only abhor violence. It also fully legitimizes violence. God himself is saying, go, murder Absolutely. your gurus. It's fine. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, 
it, it's always so difficult to talk about these texts, right? Because it's because it, 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 why? Because I think there's it doesn't give you an answer. It tells you you got to figure but, this out. So so my entire message about in this vignette of our conversation yeah. is the text dharma is to preserve paradox. Yeah, I hundred percent agree. It's not the reason it can't give you an answer is because there is no categorical answer to be given. It'll depend on the person's situation, right? And, but also on the flip side here is where you end up with the, you know, we get into the Nivrithi part, uh, Nivrithi Marga of so much of this, right? How do you break free of this paradox is there's do you know only- what, Do you know what I call this? Do you, I don't know if you've, I don't know if you've, it, it's neither here nor there, but in, uh, in uh, the first book, the goddess and the king in Indian myth, it was right. essentially um, essentially it was a, just my thesis. It was yeah, it yeah. worked, but this I call the dharmic double helix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. You call it in your right hundred percent. So yeah. what? No, what I mean to say is, apropos our conversation, yeah. that you have a double helix is where there are two strands that are they never touch, yeah, but they're intimately intertwined and they function as one entity. And this is Nivriti Dharma and Prabhati Dharma. And right. they're woven, the DNA of Hinduism is this double helix. Right. And they're woven in the Mahabharata. The Mahabharata has to come up with these terms to talk about world affirming religion and world denying religion. Well, oh, and so. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. I apologize. No, so for me, that tension of the Dharmic double helix, that is just, um, that is not going anywhere because we need both sides of that. Right. But but that tension I think is goes as far back as you can go into the Rig Veda too. Like it, it's there from, from how so? Like even the Purusha took them. Like if you go, uh, it, it goes through all the how the Purusha comes into being, and there's the, these lines that come there um, where it says non yef pantata Right? There is no other way to get immortality but through knowing that Purusha. Right. And it goes through all these actions that are happening, you know, uh, th- and everything that happens. And it just comes these little, little snippets throughout the Vedic text, whether you read Hiranyagabha Sukta or Pursa Sukta or m- any of these later suktas or even the text, there's always these hints about like, there's, yeah, all doing all this is good, but there's one way out. It always seems like there's, Something uh, by out that you usually connected to immortality. Um, I, 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 and it depends on one's, uh, I guess, I guess, sympathetic view as to when you approach these texts, too. Well, the, the, the Purusha Sukta strikes me as uh, well, it's, it's profound, um, and gripping, but it strikes me as an unabashed celebration of sacrifice and the primacy and necessity of sacrifice. Yes, but it also has I mean, in, 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 in the chanting, right? It, there's there's these two lines where it goes, it repeats twice and it, it, it connects to when it says, you know, uh, um, and it goes all the way through. And then, and then it goes, um, and I, have, I haven't chanted it in a minute, so I forget the exact part. But after it goes, uh, after it goes through the Brahmana Mukama seed, Chandarmamana Sojata, and then it says, um, Basically, it breaks down to the idea that there is only one path to immortality, and is it is by knowing that purusha that is all this that one finds that path, um, and and everything else it will lead one to 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 whatever it is what we're doing, right? Um, so I I always find that like when um, it, it, well these tensions exist from the time of the Vedic is is just my point. It's just that these tensions are kind of embedded in the very base of, of um, all of Hindu thought, the nirvitti pravitti uh, uh, clash. Well, I think they're perennially human, right? Sure, sure. And so these are problems that won't go away, and these are issues that exist in, in, in other religions as well, and they become sort of amplified and, and consciously exposited in the in the Mahabharata in particular. Well, I mean, um, I don't know if I'm going to say they exist necessarily in, in the formation in other religions. I, I think many other religions don't have the, the outwardly contradiction here because the, the religion itself will give you the out vis-a-vis, you know, just believing, right? This is not belief issue. Like, Pravitti Nirvitti is not belief issue. This is like engagement in the world issue 
right? You know, knowledge issue connected to once you know all things are one, how do you behave? You know, should you act? Should you not act? Should you should you be in the world? Should you not be in the world? And and that's where that tension is. Like for for Christianity or Islam, it's 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 just God's here. You worship, you're good to go. Um, but that that doesn't work. That doesn't play in Hinduism because of because of karma, right? Well, it's certainly very different worldviews with that question. Yeah. So I, I mean, in that regard, like, so you get into your narrative work and study. Oh yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So, so this is the problem with organic conversations. Is like you have to make sure we connect it back because. So I, it's always about the scenic route. So yeah. I, I I was I was um, I was um, uh, I was seduced by the Valmiki Ramayana and yeah. I ended up studying it and I did it. I worked. Uh, I worked more or less full time, so I did I did my degree half time, and then I finished in 2010. Yeah, and then <laughs> I went back to the workforce for a year, and I worked on campus at the University of Toronto, uh, doing more monkey work, a bunch of monkey work, uh, a bunch of hospitality work, a bunch of teaching. Uh, I don't know how it all fit into one life, but it did somehow. <laughs> I mean, was this but, like a conscious thing, or or was it like because you needed to work to make money, or was it just like, uh, like I, you I didn't know you wanted to be a professor yet. I I wasn't sure what I wanted if I wanted to do PhD. Yeah. Um, long story short, I had applied uh, too early, probably too early into my master's at the University of Toronto. Right. And for for a variety of reasons that I will not go into on this podcast, my application was not accepted. Right. And so um, I think that was demoralizing. And also it, it occasioned me to doubt my path right. and doubt whether this was the right path for me and why was this door closed to me. And then um, so because of that, I was certain that I wanted to be professor of religion, of Hindu studies, of Sanskrit yeah. literature, whatever, of comparative religion. I knew that. That's I felt that very strongly after I finished my BA. <laughs> Um, but that really occasioned me to do a lot of soul searching right? and to find, well, is this really what I want to do? I actually proposed a project on the Valmiki Ramayana as a continuation of my master's work. And then, you know, I thought, okay, well, let me go work a year and decide because what does one do with the master's in Hindu studies? Yeah, yeah. What does one do with that? What does one do with that? Like, and then, so I worked for a year. Um, managing grants <laughs> for, the, for the University of Toronto, long story. Anyhow, I did a bunch of admin work for the U of T over the years. Uh, anyhow, uh, a colleague of mine from my master's program came back from a semester at Calgary. Yeah. And she goes, you know what? You should consider working with so-and-so or so-and-so. I'm like, oh, I never even heard of the program. There are only these people. Yeah. And then um, uh, I look on the website and I discover the scholar named Elizabeth Mary Roman. <laughs> brilliant one of the one of the brightest people i've met her her mind is is quite sharp um uh but more than that i mean i, I valued her intelligence but more so i value the fact that um a she studied sanskrit narrative and yeah. b she much like me is sort of trying to correct this kind of bizarre slicing and dicing legacy of how piranhas have been studied for since colonial yeah. times yeah yeah, and so she's, you know, at that time I didn't consciously know why I gravitated until I had to write my method and theory chapter of my dissertation, mm -hmm. but I knew that she was a gal for me. Like, I just knew that, you know, I never in a thousand years thought I would go live in Alberta or really mm -hmm. anywhere else. And I'm like, you know what, I think that's the person for me and that's a program for me. It's relatively short. I'm getting old. <laughs> Um, and it just, it felt right. And it felt right to stay in Canada for some reason. And I ended up leaving the following year, 2011. Uh, I did the PhD with, with Beth Rollman at Calgary. And I came back 2014 and finished my writing in Toronto. And I realized there was a text that uh, I received a number of initiations, but one of the texts I've received initiations related to is the Chandipat or the, uh. the, the Devi, Devi Mahatmya. And it, it dawned on me one day, and you know, for me, they're they're different. I mean, you, when you're 
when they're different the mode of uh, and analyzing music theory and being moved by music are very different right yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's right but but it dawned on me that oh the Devi Mahatmya is framed by a king in Forest XL oh that was that whole thing I was wrapped up with in my in, in my masters about the Valmiki Ramayana yeah yeah what's up with these kings in Forest XL and by the way if ever someone is hunting and there's a deer involved, they're in yeah. trouble. You know they're in big <laughs> trouble because because the deer for me represents ahimsa. It's yeah, a herbivorous, yeah, it's timid animal. So the minute the king goes hunting for a deer is the minute that poverty dharma is encroaching on liberty. Yeah, yeah. Is the minute there's trouble. The is the mi- it, <laughs> exactly. It's the minute. Gods are conspiring uh, to teach the king a lesson, uh, to teach the king the power of ahimsa in one way or another. But um, oh, but I'm like, why on earth is a Devi Mahatmya framed by this exiled king in forest, uh, um, uh, mouthed by a sage? That question launched my dissertation. That question, answering that question, became uh, my first book. Actually, yeah, Goddess of the King of Indian Myth. I have that right. book. I have it on Kindle. Because uh, I couldn't uh, get a quick Fine, no worries. Uh, on uh, paperback, but uh, you know, there's an observation I want to I, I want to make is um, uh, our conversation is very much like a Purana. I feel like or a Mahabharata text, right? It's it's like we're like it, you know the text starts off with uh, you know you know uh, Ugar Shiva Sothi going a story within a story within yeah. a story, but would we have it any other way? Honestly. No, no, it wouldn't. Because it, it, but but I feel like. It, it goes to show how naturally the either the author was was writing about it or capturing these stories because like I mean it's a framing narrative right it starts with well you and I are going to have a conversation about about stuff and then suddenly you talk about a particular thing and then I'm like excuse me you, you just mentioned this can we talk go down this rabbit hole and then we close that rabbit hole we go back to where we were and they, that's what the Mahabharata is like like all these even the Puranic narrative storytelling is oh oh sage i'm going to tell you something and then this and then in the middle of the sage telling him something it's i have a question about something you just told me you remember you told me a couple lines back can we go back and talk about that full story and just but i feel like that's what we do with and conversations that they occur naturally that's what happens right without question without question so a, a part of this comes down to like these these you know, the, talking about how the colonial viewpoint is, these are monstrous narratives. It's, well, if you talk long enough, it, anything you, you talk about because it'll become monstrous. It's just going to go like... <laughs> well, I, th- I think that similar to talking about other world religions where there's yeah. a founder, they're very, it's very, um, uh, they're very left brain yeah. when you teach them. There's a founder and however artificial that may be. Yeah. It's a founder, these are the teachings, this is where it comes from. Yeah. And with Hinduism, that's not the case. So when you're looking at texts like the Puranas, clearly they're patchwork quilts, right? But I can see that they're patchwork quilt. There's there's method to the madness. They're they're, it's um you're looking at at an ancient mansion that's been renovated over centuries. Sure. This method to the madness. Clearly, there's there's there there are there are different diachronical strata, but do it for a variety of reasons. I mean, the colonial scholars decided to say, well, hey, there's a, there, there, there was a core Purana in there and there's a bunch of bastardization that we have to sift through right. to figure it out. Who corrupted, who corrupted this file? Right, right. What they fail to understand is that the most recent software is the most up-to-date. The yeah. additions to the text, right? Yeah. Right. It's the most renovated. It's the most up to date software, and and the things weren't added willy nilly. There's yeah. a great deal of thought in terms of what's being put where in the text. Right. So the Devi Mahatmya appears in the Markandi Purana. Why, of all the Puranas, of all the narratives, why do they choose to place it in the mouth of Markandeya? And those are the kinds of questions I asked. It's not. It's um. It's either short-sighted or lazy to think, well, they just put it in the Markandi Purana because right. they could. There's a, right. there's, a, there's a reason why the Markandi Purana. No, and I think that's absolutely right. I, I think, uh, you know, one of the, and and I, well, I'm going to deviate back to one other thing right now. You know, so you said Diksha, you've gotten Diksha in, in, uh, 
in in many in a few traditions in a few paths like what was your you know was your spiritual journey kind of similar to your academic journey like did they fall parallel or did one come first and then re, uh, buttress the other i mean because that's i think to me is very because you're a scholar practitioner many people are not and and that you know it, that comes with its own little you know interesting churn yeah so um i was always very i would say spiritual i probably wouldn't have used that word growing up but yeah it was abundantly clear to me that there was more to reality than meets the eye. Yeah. Like I was very rationalistic. I had, you know, I was one of these people who just had the mind to get decent marks and be lazy until yeah. maybe grade 11 or something. Just, yeah. uh, just gifted in that way. Didn't serve me for work ethic. I had to learn that later in life, but um, the left brain was working, but I, I still, I knew that people were more than, than, than matter. It was just instinctive to me. Right. Um, I, I knew that synchronicities were very real. Like these are real, like I didn't have a word for it. Sure. Right. This is, this is a real phenomenon. You know, um, I'm, 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 I had this sort of inclination throughout my life. Um, uh, organized religion certainly wasn't for me. Sure. And certainly not, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm superstitious Hinduism. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Yeah. And then, and then I, I left school and I had a really, really, really dark night of the soul in 2003. That winter was, was one of the darkest I've ever had. I, yeah. There's, you know, darkness comes and goes. That's the nature of property, but, um, um, a dark night of the soul. And I was not in a good space at all. And yeah. I realized that was just, it's a bunch of emotional issues I never dealt with. And I was just, you know, I was like on a path of utter self-destruction. Uh, and then I said, this has to shift. And I decided to get up in the morning, every morning and do some kind of practice. I was hungry for knowledge about mm -hmm. mantras. I was hungry for philosophies. It's so ironic, much like some of my uh, uh, Western associates who may have Indian souls. It was so similar that I go and I find a, a, a book published by a Westerner about Indian mantras. Right? Like, this is really cool. This is really interesting. So I was, I was hungry to deepen my spirituality and, and leverage my God-given wisdom and insight, but also to ameliorate my malaise and, and, and heal my soul. I thought, well, why not start with what's closest to home, right? So I was finding books about uh, Indian spirituality and all that. And that was uh, around the time where my manager said, you really need to go back. I, I, shortly thereafter, I got this job. And about mm -hmm. six to nine months in, the manager said, look, this job pays double. Right. It's a sales and marketing job. I'm like, I've never taken a sale. I've never taken a business course in my life. I'm not doing a sales and marketing job. She's like, you'd be perfect for it. And it pays double. What the hell's the matter with you? Right. But you need to go. So anyhow, um, when I went to university for Hinduism, the woman that was supposed to teach the course, Archie Dond, happened to be pregnant with her second child that year. Mm. Karma, <laughs> Daiva has intervened. <laughs> so she could not teach intro to Hinduism. Another woman by the name of Gillian McCann, who's now, I think, um, associate professor at Nipissing University in Northern Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, she was a sessional. She was finishing her PhD at the time. She was teaching that course. So great. So the course was over and we had sort of connection. We had a meeting of the minds and we, we engage each other. And she happened to be good friends with a woman who yet ran a yoga studio. Right. And at that yoga studio, an Indian master would come and give uh, satsangs on uh, the yoga sutras, the Bhagavad Gita. And so ironically, it was through my academic study of Hinduism that I met my guru, my primary guru in this life. And I studied with him probably on and off day in and day out uh, from the time I met him in 2005 until um, I left for the PhD. And then he went to India because he knew his time was soon to be up and he passed a year or two later. Wow. And that was that. He passed in 2017. But I had the good fortune of, um, of, of meeting, uh, meeting a wizard. <laughs> <laughs> I met the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> yeah. Gandalf. I met Gandalf. Yeah, yeah. I met Gandalf. Um, sometimes my clients make jokes and like, are you Yoda? I'm like, honestly, if you met my guru, you would think I was Frodo, not Yoda. Not, not Gandalf. <laughs> that was Frodo. 
Um, but yeah, so, so I was studying Hinduism uh, and doing my whole scholarship and the men thing and work thing, yeah. but deepening my spiritual practice, deepening my daily sadhana, um, deepening my repertoire of, 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 of mantra recitations and upayas and practices, learning also some, for lack of a better word, maybe esoteric knowledge. Mm. Right, and this was this was profound. I I honestly thought it was the work of fables to have people who had clairvoyant ability or knowledge of the future, or yeah. someone will walk into a room and they could know that person's chart by, at a glance. I honestly thought that was the work of myth, right? In the pejorative for that word sense. No, absolutely. No. And um, he, you know, one cannot begin to convey in words what a guru does for someone, right. a bona fide guru. That's right. One cannot begin to convey that in words. But apropos uh, our conversation, he gave me a glimpse into the mystery, into the possibility, into what mastery can yield. Yeah. And wow. it's, it's, it's not of this world. Right, right. It's, it's, it, the, the abilities you have are not possible scientifically. Right, right. Uh, nor will they ever be possible scientifically. Science need not be the measure of humanity. No, no human right. spirit can be measured by empiricism is my view. But it's, it's meeting masters such as my primary master, teacher, guru, um, that I really got a glimpse into what was possible for human consciousness once refined. Yeah, beyond the veil, right? You know, beyond the veil yeah. of what we look. I mean, that's that's amazing. Um, I mean, I can tell you're 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 just still thinking about it, right? You know, like just bringing them up is 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 powerful to you. Um, what was uh what was the the sampraday or tradition that he came from? More, it was a shakta. Was he uh, uh, you know Vaishnava Shaivite? Did he not have an affiliation? He didn't have any particular affiliation. He's um. He, he was awake. He was a man who was awake and certainly he was in his first rodeo, so to speak. Yeah. But he, he taught in the Bhagavad Gita. That was very dear to him. Yeah. Uh, he taught on the Yoga Sutras. He initiated a bunch of us into um, um, Chandipat, yeah. Devi Sadhanas, various Sadhanas. I mean, he was, uh, I don't know how to pronounce the words, but he was an extraordinarily um, aware, powerful tantric master. Yeah, and by tantra I don't mean my 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 all too famous joke now is by tantra I don't mean black magic or good sex, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right? If you if you want to black magic, call it black magic. If you want good sex, call it good sex. I mean tantra, yeah. actual tantra. Yeah. Um. 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 And but he didn't have a particular sampradaya, and I would say that uh, nor do I. You know, I studied. I took initiations with different masters at different times for different purposes in different spaces. But he, by far, was my, 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 my guru. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No. Absolutely. No. That's uh, you know, guru is very important. It's uh, almost, almost necessary for any sort of true spiritual growth. Right. Um, you know, especially within the the, the texts themselves, kind of require it. Um, but that's fascinating, man. I mean, I. I what during the time period that you were learning the texts you, in the academic setting, you were also learning probably the same texts in a much different setting with with your guru, well, right? So, what's so interesting how, is yeah. what's interesting is that um, no, because for, it was interesting. Like I, you know, you take a bunch of courses as part of an uh, an, uh, an undergrad. Yeah, you take a bunch of courses as part of a, a master's, and they were very. Um, they were fairly compartmentalized for me mm. because the because they were, they were very very different enterprises. So it wasn't until the PhD that and I had sort of misgivings. Do I really want to study the the Chandipat academically? Like, do I really want to do that? That's kind of like well, somebody has to, I guess. Why not? Yeah, Why yeah. not study it? Why not? It needs to be done. Why not? But it wasn't until the PhD that anything related to my spirituality or my my spiritual life was connected to my. You know, it's not like I did the, the Valmiki Ramayana because it was a great bhakta of Sri Rama. That wasn't my yeah, personal yeah. path. That's just like I was gripped by this narrative. And now right. I have a better understanding of why. Um, but no, with my time, I call it Mantriji. My time with Mantriji was 
it uh, was spiritual, spiritual, deep spiritual training. And my time at the academy was intellectual training and professional development. And now I'm able to more so integrate them. Um, but you see, when you're teaching undergrads, you're teaching undergrads. When you're teaching continuing studies, you're te teaching continuing studies. When you're teaching initiates, you're teaching initiates. And yes. they're very, very different. Um, so I have this sort of pedagogical strategy that I call rigor without reduction, where you teach things responsibly, assuming you're, you're, you know, you're teaching in a public space for continuing oh. studies. You're teaching responsibly. You're not going to say the Mahabharata is 5,000 years old because it couldn't possibly empirically be 5,000 years old, right? You could say the tradition holds it as such because they have done the dating based on the alignments and the last time we had this alignment was 5,000 years ago. Yes, you can yeah, say yeah. that Yeah, clearly. But one teaches, one teaches these texts with an, uh, the assumption is not that religion is just culture sure. and, and politics. Right, there is a human spirit. There is a divine presence. Sure. Yeah. Right there, and this is important. Whether or not folks can perceive that or experience that, folks who teach religion need to leave space for that. Yeah, yeah, I could not. Right, I they need to leave space for that. So, so there needs to be space for the spiritual element of religions, even when we teach them at the academy. In my view, um, but at the same time. It's difficult. It's easy for people to use their critical thinking and be reductionistic. And it's easy for people to get swept up in some bhavana and not think. Sure, sure. But, but the, it's difficult, I find, for people to do them both or integrate them in some way. No, I, I, think, that's, I think that's fair. Um, I mean, I mean from, from here, we can actually jump into the part about the, you know, I mean, I really want to discuss, because in the beginning of your book of, uh, in, in in the goddess and the king, you 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 deal with um, the current way or not? The, well, yeah, kind of current, but the historic, too current way of of how the academia has dealt with not only narratives but like dating texts and thinking about what the role is. Um, and and on this point is, is you know is one of the things is you know one of my big gripes is generally. We have no sense of dating on any of this stuff. Most of this stuff, we have we have a passage here and there that might show you a certain anachronism that might have come in some other time period, or, or like you said, built on the successive, uh, uh, you know, software updates, you know, <laughs> throughout time. But um, I I always find it difficult to 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 have these random dates where, like for example, Brockington thinks of these layers in the Mahabharata or Ramayana, which I just find like the layer theory to be utterly stupid. Um, just because I've like, you, you can't describe what layers are. You have no criteria by which you build these layers out. I just don't understand how some of the pseudoscience, and it does appear to be pseudoscience to me, um, is taken to be like God's God's word. And, and, and you address it in a very respectful way, by the way. Like I, I don't have any, inclination to yeah I, I wonder my, my my wonder yeah what i'm curious about is where is the um, uh, clearly you're unimpressed <laughs> and but I tell me a little bit about that there. what is it that's i i think the i think the scholar the rigor is not there what it, it, what happens is for a lot of these people is they take the maybes into realities right like oh it could maybe this and then they just assume it's true right uh, and, and this is like you know a part of this is like, uh, I, I think, so I come from a legal background. I'm a lawyer. I'm also, I, you know, I did my master's in, in philosophy, in Western philosophy, you know, be, basically continental philosophy of like Descartes, Spinoza, you know, those guys. Um, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get the master's because I got really, um, let's just say inebriated and did not to decide to go down that path. Um, so I just, I was a lawyer. Um, I just don't find the rigor um in in the way they they reason through it and it just seems to be when they choose to have something be a certain way there's no way to falsify what they what they what they they hypothesize 
No, I've yet to read a paper in which says it says I thought actually it was this, but it actually came out to be this. It's always oh I I said this and look here I found evidence to show me X Y Z. I I have and this is my and I've read, you know whether you look at the pre colonial literature I mean colonial literature or modern literature with Brockington and uh, Eli Franco and these you know a, a lot of a lot of these scholars that talk this way I just don't find find it to be rigorous it's 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 not they're not your cup of chai shall we say <laughs> yeah um, well i don't drink chai but that's fine uh, yeah uh, <laughs> yeah they're not your cup of tea yeah. um uh coffee um they're, they're yeah so for me i can't really evaluate the merits of whether or not they're doing diachronic dissection successfully mostly because I'm not inclined to do that period. I don't feel right. there are there are there there is a school of thought or there are principles for for um, you know the the, the the method whereby they established the critical edition of the Mahabharata or all the Sanskrit texts, for example. There are right. principles at play for um, slicing and dicing sure. um, that are important. But for me, my instinct. Um, has always been and still is that the text is the way it is for a very important reason and makes sense the way it is. Even if it is, the issue is folks can't, this is, this is the, this is the difficulty. We think of like, oh, there's an article by an author. Oh, it's uh, an article in the International Journal of Hindu Studies by some right. dude named Raj Balkaran. Great. He sat there and he wrote it, and that was that. What year did he write it in? Yeah. And the idea of multiple authorship over time, th then the instinct is, well, what was the original and who added to it and when? Sure. And I think that is the, the tension where I go with that is, is, is it's, it's, as I say, like it's, it's, it's wings added to a house, a mansion. Sure. It's um, uh, it, where the text ended up was purposeful. And so synchronic reading is what I do. Right. right. It, it, it's, it's the philosophy of alpha. I, I always mess up his last name. Hiltabital. 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 Who, who and I think yeah, is actually very yeah. rigorous. So, uh, for oh, he is he, he's he's beyond brilliant and yeah. uh, Archie Dond. I was teasing Archie Dond one day about um, Alf Hiltabital, and I was gushing. Basically, I said he's like the godfather of Mahabharata studies, and she ends up saying it on her podcast. And now I've said it on this one. <laughs> no, I mean, no, it's true. I've read all his all his work. You know, like as much as I can grab, and and he he, he the rigor he brings to that table, and the ability to sit down and be like. Let me actually think about why this text was the way it is. Instead of being like, well, it clearly because there's disjunction, it must mean that it's not. Corruption, right? It, yeah. It's a corrupt text. Right? And, and I think that's like, you're, you're coming at it from the point of view of, of, his, of the way the, the Bible, in, a, in historical Bible studies is, right? Like when you look at, like, for example, what Bart Ehrman does or, or Ellen Pagels, and they look at their... They're, they're that's ex exactly. that's exactly right. You hit the nail on the head in terms of where that bias comes from or is perpetuated. Right. That they kind of and I and I think um, that, that makes sense for for the Bible, but doesn't make sense for our text. Well, um, you know the Devi Mahatmya, you know, these three glorious episodes of the Divine Mother and her her martial exploits to you know quell the forces of evil. We all know what it's like to have a king on the throne that's sort of tyrannical. Right, <laughs> and we all we all we all want to invoke some higher power to overthrow them at some time. Right, um, um, and these episodes are, are glorious, and they are the Devi Mahatmya. But the piece in the beginning, the piece at the end, where there's a king who loses his kingdom and goes into a forest, and then he, uh, you know, he has a conversation with the sage, and the sage tells him, and then at the end, um, he goes off and worships the Devi, and his kingdom is restored. And then the Devi says to him, "Look." I'll not only give you my king, your kingdom back in this life, in your next life, you'll be the son of the sun, Surya. Yeah. I'll you'll make you the Manu of the next Manu, age. Yeah. You'll become Surya's son. So what I do is those little pieces that everyone says a flimsy frame, yeah. just to latch it into the Manvantara discourse of the Markani Purana, the, yeah. the section of the Markani Purana that's dedicated towards um, elucidating the, the careers of the, the 14 Manvantaras of this epoch, right? So... It's a flimsy frame just 
to to conceit just so we can house it in the Manvantara section of the of the Markani Purana. Um, <laughs> they weren't bored like they weren't like let's just put it in there today or yeah. it's it's basically my entire ten thousand everything... words to fill just throw it in <laughs> the, 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 basically what i do is the opposite i said let's focus on the frame yeah i focus on the frame boom the Devi mahatma is about kingship and restoring royal power it prioritizes that over the pursuit of moksha the merchant getting to moksha the king gets kingship Look at the frame. It's telling you why the central episode is Devi restoring the throne of Mahisha. Nobody knew that the Devi Mahatmya was composed in an intricate ring composition until the this, this study. Yeah. And that ring composition is supported by and, and even um, begun by uh, the, the frame narrative. Right. It's telling you a story with its very structure. It's, it's artful. And so part of what I do in studying, you know, studying Sanskrit narrative literature is trying to come up with or, or sort of articulate um, methods for doing that in a synchronic fashion. One way is ring theory. Always pay attention to frames. Who is speaking? Who are they speaking to? Um, what's the circumstance? Right. That's going to tell you so much about the exposition within the text. And so... Yeah, it sounds like um, I'm in good company, but anyhow, I knew oh, that no, I, 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 I love that in your book is is like that was a it was a beautiful, um, in, insightful way to really just and quite honestly, a brilliant way to look at the, the Devi Mahatmya within a text. I mean, I, I feel like in some sense it's it was it's it's kind of there in your face staring at you, but because it's so obvious people just like go right past it. Right. Like, especially when, when, when they're, when they're focusing on other things, right. It, it in some ways it reminds me of, of like, even the framing, when you look at the Mahabharata, the story of the, the Rama story in the Mahabharata, right. Well, it's framed within the context of where Vanavasa of Yudhishthira, when he's like, Oh, woe is me. My life sucks. Who, who has had it worse than me? And then here's two stories here. Here's one of Nala and Damayanti and the one of Rama. Right. And, then, and do you remember who tells him that story? Yeah, I do. I do. Who? It, it, it was it was Domia, their uh, their their priest, I believe. No. It, it was Mark and Day. Oh yeah, Mahogany. it was Mark and Day. You're correct. You're correct. Oh my so god. My I'm I'm like, wait a minute. The whole Valmiki Ramayana thing was in the back of my brain, and the yeah. whole Davy Mahatmya thing in the Mark and put was in the back of my brain. I'm like, what the heck is up with Mark and Daya? So I talk a little bit about that in the in, in the in the Surya Mahatmya book. Yeah. But for me, there's. There's a reason why Mark and Day is teaching them about Rama. That's, yeah. that's important somehow. Yeah. But anyhow, that's, oh, it's, no. it's, please continue. No, no, I was just saying it's, 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 it's amazing that you, that you developed this or you, you found this narrative framework and how it connects to these other narrative frameworks across Hindu tradition or Puranic tradition or what do you want to call it? Well, that's the power. If you, if you, um, if you're watching an episode of Wonder Woman, yeah, or the movie or something, yeah, and if Aquaman shows up, and you don't, you haven't watched the Aquaman movie, you're not going to get the richness of why Aquaman is making a cameo appearance in this narrative. There's a reason for that. There's a very sure. important reason why Mark and Dea is telling the Pandavas themselves about the story of Rama. Why is Mark and Dea the one who has um, that privilege? What is it about him that's so exalted that he is overtly connecting the Sanskrit epics? That is important. Right. People don't ask those kinds of questions. You know, right. Different kinds of questions. Well, it, it, but, but that's, that's really fascinating to me. And, and going back to, to your book on this, like, so can you, can you tell us what that, that, the ring, the ring narrative, the ring structure? The ring composition. Yeah. yeah. So ring composition is, is, is a structure that we see in the ancient world, uh, not just in in, 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 in in South Asia, but essentially um, the stories, let's just say there are, let's, if you hold up your hand and there are five parts, say one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. The, the midpoint, the middle thing is the thing you're supposed to focus on. Yeah. So you say five chapters. The third chapter is the most important chapter. Mm -hmm. The first chapter relates to the last chapter. The second chapter relates to the fourth chapter. You, you uh -huh. do... You come around and the midpoint is the keystone to the text. Okay. Um, I, I just, just this, this really um, 
this really concise phrase of Tolkien's there and back again. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Comp- yeah, there and back again. That's the hero's journey as well. Right. It ends up, you end up where you start. And whenever you have a frame narrative, you necessarily end up where you start because you're back in the, like um, 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 Chronicles of Narnia, the Lion, yeah. Witch, and the Wardrobe. They, they end up where they start because then now they come back out from the wardrobe. But right? you're different at this point. You've become a different person. Exactly. So, so the, the text is structured as this ring. And the midpoint, Mary Douglas talks about this. I'm convinced Mary Douglas wrote that book right before she passed just for my thesis. But Mary Douglas writes this book having studied the book of numbers and various other literature. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's called Thinking in Circles. I can't quite remember the title, but for me, it was like, it was the piece I needed. Like I knew that the Devi Mahatmi was doing this, but I didn't know what it was called. (laughs) Right, right, right. And she gave me the theories to to realize, oh, this is, oh, this is ring composition. The second, the the, the second episode is the most crucial. This is the, this is the Mahishasura Mardini pose. It's it's this majestic vision of the divine mother all decked out slaying Mahisha, the most iconographically um, 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 rich, famous moment of the Devi, perhaps. Mm-hmm. It's in episode two of the text because episode two, they call it the, 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 the Madhima uh, uh, act. Mm-hmm. They don't call the acts uh, um, act one, act two, act three. They call the acts act first, act middle, act last. Because you can't put a fourth or fifth, not right, a lot. Right. You have to make keep this the middle act because this is the structure of the temple of the text. Wow. Anyhow, I digress. Uh, what, <laughs> 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 what else do you want to know that has to do with something relevant to, uh, to other people? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But this is what, it, it's it's awesome. I love it. I love it. I love learning about this. And I think a lot of our, our listeners would, would love this idea too, because it now when they go back and think about their text, like when they look, read whatever put on or whatever, they, they can start thinking about it that way too in, in how they approach it. Well, this this whole framing journey of mine, I was I was asking why the Devi Mahatmya is framed by the King in Exile, and that became a PhD thesis. Yeah. And as I'm doing that, I'm asking, well, why is Devi Mahatmya in the Mark of Purana at all? And that became a Journal of Vaishnava Studies article. And then I'm asking this question of, wait a minute, the Mark and Dea Purana is framed by four birds. Mm. Four birds are mouthing the works of Mark and Dea. And these four birds are descendants of the survivors of the burning of the Khandava in the Mahabharata. What the hell is going on here, kids? Like, what on earth is happening here? And not just anywhere in the Mahabharata, the end, the framing of the Adi Parvan, the terminal frame of the opening frame of the Mahabharata is where these these four birds have flown from to frame the Markani Purana. Clearly, this is important. (laughs) Clearly. Well, to my story brain, anyhow, maybe I'm just grasping at straws, but probably not because it ended up getting published in the International Journal of Hindu Studies. That the the art the, the, the thought process of, of, of why the Markandeya Purana is invoking the birds of the Khandava and the burning of the Khandava. So 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 upakyanas or subtails, as Helta Bital says, are not just meaningfully framed but um, entire Puranic works are framed yeah. and they're now even framed externally or intertextually sort yeah. of pointing to Mahabharata. So this is, this is, um, it's, uh, it's dizzying and exciting. I mean, if you care about these things, otherwise you've switched off already. Oh, but, uh, <laughs> I, I love this. No, question. not you, not you, yeah. the listeners. I mean, oh, <laughs> but, who cares about listeners? I just care about me right now. <laughs> Okay, what else would you like to know? Then? <laughs> no, so uh, I mean, the role of Mark and Dan. It, so, can you explain why? Why is the story of Devi in Mark and Dea? Why is Mark and Dea as a character so important to telling this magnificent story? Where 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 Devi first? This is the, the real first powerful Shakti motif as as pure and all powerful as she is coming out right this is this is her it's, great it's um it's the Davies debut in Brahmanism yeah yeah <laughs> it's her magnanimous debut yeah and I, the I mean, question she's is in other tech in all other stuff oh. and, but here she comes out like I am everything boom 
And and your question is about Markandeya? Yeah, why why is why is he important to that? Well, I have a sort of hypothesis about that. I don't know that we'll ever know, right? These right. aren't answers we'll find, but in my view, um, one of the most important features of Markandeya, what is Markandeya known for? He's known for surviving the last pralaya. That is cataclysmically important because pralaya itself is a dilution of all things. Yeah, yeah. Like pralaya, it's not just a dilution of people or sages. It's a dilution of 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 the grahas themselves. It's the dilution of the universe. the universe. Yeah. So how could a being, a human being, however sagacious, however exalted, like how could Sage Mark and Deus survived Pralaya. This is telling you something very important about him. He represents preservation. Hmm. He represents poverty dharma. And he's always he, connected he, to Vishnu in that sense, right? As like Vishnu Asia. is Vishnu. Vishnu is who? Vishnu is what? Preserver incarnate. Devi does the dharma of uh, uh, Vishnu. This is why that article got put into the Journal of Vaishnava Studies, because what I was yeah. saying is Devi and Markandeya and, and, and kings themselves, they represent the function, the cosmogonic function of Vishnu. Right. Preservation. Markandeya is preserved across Pralaya. In both, the, in the Devi Mahatmya, we have a story about the Devi's uh, um, salvific acts at Pralaya. In the Surya Mahatmya, another Mahatmya discovered, in the Markandeya Purana, it starts off with Surya's salvific acts at Pralaya. There is a theme of preservation and the work of kings and the need to strive and remain in the mud of life. This, 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 uh, I can't quite, I need more evidence, but I'm convinced there's something there. Um, 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 and, and this is related to why Markandeya is voicing the story of Rama, mm. right? Yeah, that's it's, was, it's it's the poverty dharma piece. It's the poverty dharma piece. Rama has to come back from exile. Hate it or not, Rama's happiest in exile, you know. Yeah, but 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 it's Sita. also yeah, it's also funny that Markandeya, who is Nivrti Dharma, who's never going to get married, who's 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 out on his own, is espousing Pravrti Dharma. That is the Dharmic <laughs> double helix. This is why it's a Dharmic double helix. The sage teaches the king how to rule. It's brilliant. Yeah. Right? It's brilliant. It's, it's, it's the same sage goes with Bhishma. teaches the king how right? to rule. Like Bhishma teaching He's like, Yishra. look, if you want to... <laughs> exactly. But it's so powerful. Bhishma fallen. It's such a... I don't know what they were smoking or what they were chanting <laughs> to come up with these, just just beyond like like what that scene? whether it was um, inspired by substance or by the divine. <laughs> no, Bhishma is laying supine on a bed of arrows. Right, right. He's bloodied. He's this is the most bloody scene of the war. He's bleeding from every pore. And he's untouched, like the lotus in the middle of the hurricane. Yeah. He's, he's, he's expositing. And what is he expositing? He's giving the crucial teachings for Yudhishthira to be a Dharma Raja, to be, to be the king of Dharma or Dharma right. king, however you want to take it. Right. And he's saying, despite all this, despite where I end up, right? Yeah. You need to go and be a king. You but need to wage war when you need to wage war. You know, I'll say it this way too. It's it's so funny because in that same, the, when the, the story happens, you know, Yudhishthira asks Bhishma, and the Bhishma turns to Krishna and says, you tell him, you know everything. And then Krishna's response is, no, I, this is your place. It's so much like the way a guru is, right? Why why go to a god and then God will say, go to a guru. You learn from him, right? So this is such a... It's always through these texts, like even when 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 the start of the Mahabharata, when they ask Vyasa to say uh, the the Mahabharata at some point, he says he tells Vaishnavaya, you you, you tell the, the the Mahabharata. It's it's always passing down knowledge through somebody else. It is, and it's also what I call expositor import. Yeah, the text is now imprinted with the energy and the biography of the expositor. Yeah. It could be the same story, but the person telling you the story is going to add the flavor of their own biography right. implicitly or explicitly. Right. So Bhishma is telling him, because what did Bhishma have to do? Look at his story. 
Look at what look at what he had to do to secure the kingship. Yeah. Look yeah. at the terrible vow he had to make. And the terrible right? things he did. And his whole life shows the problem the evidence is the problematization of kingship in the text. Yeah. And, and yet look at his advice to Yudhishthira. And you know and this is sometimes I, I it frustrates me a lot with 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 Hindus or people that read these texts sometimes is you we need to stop deifying all these people to a point where where where, where you're saying oh see don't emulate them or don't don't talk about them that way the purpose of these texts is so that we can that we can we we can inter interrogate them and 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 spend time as interlocutors with them and grapple with them and I think like you can't say oh don't call Bhishma massage like uh, massage he had misogyny in him the way he treated Amba Ambika Ambalika like you can't say that obviously he had at least he was also the per person that said if you love love the man go back to him but it's also let's grapple with the complexity of these beings but the text itself does it it's just it's chastising vishma yeah the text itself chastises krishna yeah that's the power of the narrative the, 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 the that's the power the minute you have a black and white view of the mahabharata yeah. or the puranas or of hinduism is the minute you're blind oh i totally agree because the text's job is to illumine multiple perspectives it's a religion conference it's not yeah. a diatribe it's not yeah. a sermon no it's a conference right and that's the power of the text but, but to go back to your point in my view people in my view there there are two pitfalls that are diff very difficult for people to stay out of yeah one one pitfall is um looking to these narratives as one pitfall is dismissing them as fantasy or nonsense yeah right one pitfall is just dismissing narratives as fanciful mm -hmm. and another pitfall is taking them as you know the gospel truth pun intended mm -hmm. and to me the power the power of myth the power of purana is to 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 engage them as spiritually true as metaphorically true as, as the most insightful and eloquent teachers about human existence and the ascent of consciousness sure. in narrative form. So one need not take them as literally true to do that, to engage them in that way. And one need not take them as, as fancy or conceit or superstition. These are um, the, the function of the Mahabharata and the Puranas in my view is pedagogical. Sure, sure. And, but but I, I would say even if you do take it literally true, like, then take it literally true. Take take the point that these texts are are interrogating their characters. They're they're calling them out. They're 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 putting them on on, on notice. Right when when Krishna gets chastised by Gandhari, you know Krishna's like, I, I am. I, you can't do that to me. I'm God. You're you're dead. No, it's he takes a chastisement. Yeah, Why? But Krishna. But Krishna look at what Gandhari through her tapas and through her righteousness has done. She's, she's cursed Krishna to the destruction of his entire clan. Yeah. yeah. The text is saying, yeah. the lady has a point. <laughs> yeah, the lady has a point. And he's like, all right, I, I'll take your, I'll take your, I'll take your curse. Right. And, and, you know, there's a telling scene when, when he's going uh, back to Dwarka where he meets Uttanka. I, I'm sure you know this, where, where, where Uttanka like basically says, you're God, you could have, you could have done any of this. You could have changed any of this. And then uh, this, Krishna shows him his Vishwarupam and then and then it explains to him, actually, and Yutaka's like, I'm gonna curse you. And, and Krishna's like, before you curse me, let me tell you, when I take I when I take form as man, I, I behave as a man. When I take form as Naga, I behave as he goes through all this, he limits himself to his, the role that he takes. But then the idea again is we have to look at these gods, even if they're gods, in the human context, because they're human at this point. They're not playing the god role all the time well they're, they're when we study shakespeare and yeah. we're completely moved by the power of literature yeah we're not too concerned about whether or not it actually literally happened and sure. to me that's the point the point is that the truth is the world within the text mm -hmm. not the world behind the text 
there is a world within the text. Whether you believe that's a fictitious world or or not, the the, the power is is leveraging what you see in the text for your life. There's a course that I'm doing now at uh, a place called Soma Yoga Institute called Mythic Wisdom for Modern Life. Mm. That's not a contradiction for me. These ancient narratives, <laughs> their job is to preserve um, life wisdom, yeah. insights that we will always need. Sure. Right? But those insights need not only survive within a specific cultural, theistic, or devotional context. I, I agree. Totally agree. Right? What else would you like to know? <laughs> no, no. I mean, it, 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 it just it just this conversation I'm enjoying just because there's so much to touch upon that. I, I feel like it's, it's a, uh, could go never ending in many ways because there's so many different. Uh, uh, so can we talk a little bit about the, so what role in the Devi Mahatmya? It's, it's about her greatness, right? About her, about her. Um, Mahatmya. Yeah. Mahatmya. Sorry. I said Mahatmya. That, that, I don't know why I said that. That's my bad. No, no. What I mean to say is literally her, her it's about her Mahatmya. Yeah. It's about her greatness. So, why in this text is it framed within the context of a war between gods and the asuras and and what about that is so particular to the king or to the merchant that would make if there is some reason for that well in the first episode um vishnu has just sprawled out after Possibly. pralaya yeah. he's going into his yogic slumber right yeah. he's going into his little tr- retreat and madhu and kaitaba are born of his earwax essentially and they they run down to kill brahma and and brahma basically chants to the mother divine to yeah. awaken vishnu right because she's maya but she's also the way out of maya right yeah yeah um and it's, it's probably more in the second or third episode you're referring to where in both of these episodes the the throne of heaven uh, indra's throne is usurped by demonic forces right in, the, in in episode two it's mahisha episode three it's shumba and the shumba right and what we have here is a problem this is the problem of when wicked people are in positions of power mm-hmm. we 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 know this problem i'm sure um we've lived this problem i'm sure yeah but the the the, the she the Devi is a royal figure, right? Her dharma is the dharma of kings, or queens. Her dharma is to preserve. She does on the cosmic level what the king does on the earthly level. Hmm. Whenever there's imbalance and we need a course correction and someone fancies himself too powerful, she comes and she kicks him in the butt and that's that. Right or decapitates them more likely <laughs> um, uh, because you know kicking in the butt doesn't work and then beating them up with a baseball bat doesn't work and they're just intent on nonsense so you just gotta you know get the job done move on violence um <laughs> yes but this is crucial but she is showing that violence is uh quintessential to the work of kings, to the work of Vishnu, to the work of the goddess, to the work of preservation. We cannot be preserved in this world without violence. Right. The violence required to eat. The violence required to safeguard ourselves against people who want to destroy us. Right. This is crucial to the text, the justification of violence. So why do you think the, the Durga Puja was the greatest uh, royal consecration festival known to India? Because of the Devi's representation of the Dharma of kings. Wow. Um, so how does the merchant connect then? The merchant's just, um, he's a lip service to Niverty. <laughs> <laughs> because the, <laughs> so, <laughs> so the merchant, the, 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 <laughs> the merchant is also finds himself in this forest um, right. because his family steals his money and kicks him out, basically. Right. They're both upset. The king and the merchant are both upset. They both receive sage counsel from from Midas, the sage in the who teaches them about the glories of of the Devi. Needs wisdom too, right? And then That's when they're funny. done, <laughs> this, exactly right. And and the merchant's name Samadhi. <laughs> his name is Samadhi, right? The merchant. So it's it's archetypal. It's it's okay. his name is Samadhi. So at the end of it, they both go and together create a murti 
offer water, fire, incense, uh, chanting. They even offer the blood of their own limbs. Mm. This is homage to, to poverty in the Dharma of Kings. And after three long years, she appears and she says, I'm so pleased by your penance. Whatever you wish, I'm a giver of boons. Whatever you wish, I will grant to you. Yeah, yeah. A noble king and 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 a, a, a wise merchant, and the king says, "I just want my kingdom back." Yeah, and the merchant says, "I'm done with this bullshit world." He doesn't say that, but I'm saying that. He's like, yeah. "Give me, please, grant me what I need. That insight that takes me beyond minus and minus. I'm done. Forget it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Enough with this money counting." And the devi says, "No problem." He blesses the merchant with moksha. And she, she blesses the king with uh, the power to reclaim his his kingdom through force. He even uses the term through force. Go, I bless you to go, and by my grace, you will overpower your enemies, just as they've overpowered you, because you are the rightful king. And yeah. so but she doesn't say, oh, my God, what a foolish king, and wow, you glorious merchant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. There were others, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, um, Wendy Doniger makes the argument in um, the Hindus and alternate history that the merchant is the hero of the text. One may well, I understand why one may think so, because moksha is an ideal in Hinduism. But the text clearly, in my view, or at least the view of the book I wrote, <laughs> says that no, um, no, no, no. The king is the hero of the text. The merchant is an afterthought. She blesses the king without chastisement and she doubles up his blessing and says, and when you're done, I'm going to exalt you to the Lord of an age as the son of the sun, Surya preservation, king yeah. preservation, Devi preservation, Markandeya preservation. The, the purpose of these narratives is to slightly have the pendulum swing back away from the, the let's all renounce and sing Kumbaya. Right, right. Ideology. Right. Um, 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 and what's interesting, so for me, the the, the, the the dual booning, this is a Dharmic double helix in one fell swoop. She's blessing someone to lord over creation and someone to opt out of creation. And she is primordial power. She's She has to have these dual um, um, manifestations of power. Right, right. right. And so... So I'm not sure that I've answered your question. No, you, you, uh, you totally did. I mean, that makes total sense. It, it, to me, it's, it's that's just awesome. That's, but, but but the idea that there has to be a hero again to me is doesn't make sense within uh, the narrative structure uh, for for a lot of Hindu texts. The because you because we have the concept of the Purushartha. That if you want to go down this path, here go down this path. Like if you want if you want to be part, you want to be rich, you want to be. Well, if you want to follow dharma, just go down that path, right? It's it's not saying that you have to you have to get moksha. If you want moksha, if if you if you're done with this world, here's the path to it, right? That's what I always feel like the texts are trying to say is live in this world as long as you want to be, but if you want to get out, here's the way out. Oh, if uh, I was teaching a course, where was it? I had such a good time. Oh, yogic studies. I was teaching this course really interested students, right? I was teaching, teaching a course called Yoga and Hindu Mythology. Who yeah. who knew so many people were interested in learning about Hindu mythology, quote unquote. <laughs> and so um, one of the questions that came in one of the Q&As is, um, you know, it, we had answered all the questions uh, <laughs> pertaining to the course material. And for whatever reason, people tend to be fascinated about my path or life or perspectives beyond. So they end sure. up asking me these questions from beyond and one student says um do you need to be a vegetarian to be a yogi <laughs> and I, said, I, I love the way you said that like like do you need to be a vegetarian to be like a yogi <laughs> like oh my god but that's not quite um no it was it was a very well-intentioned question in yeah. my view and um i said uh, i said if you want my honest opinion um, there are vegetarians in this world who are just, you know, um, malicious people. Terrible people. And, and there are beef eaters who are, who are uh, you know, on the road to sainthood. Like, yeah, yeah. So what I, what, I, what I said is that, um, in my view, the mark of a, of a yogi is conduct, yeah. not food choice. But what about ahimsa? What about the animals? 
I said, well, if you're called to activism or that's your job or you're calling, great. And if not, then it's not your problem that people do what they're going to do with their lives. But the, I think the most crucial piece, she said, well, how can you say that? How can you believe that? And I said, look, how could you be a Hindu and, and value these things? And, you know, you seem like you're a spiritual man. How could you say that? Yeah. I said, it's quite simple. If you, if you actually adopt an Indic or a Hindu worldview, you know that it takes us bloody millennia to get anywhere. <laughs> Why would you assume that everybody like you, sweet cheeks, is ready to give up meat? Let them have their lifetimes of whatever they need to have. Why do you assume that everybody should be ready for moksha right now? Where is this? Where is this collapsing of all of of all the of samsara into one uh, generation? This is right. it's not realistic. Right, People have right. vasanas; they have to work them out. Let but them work out their vasanas. It, 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 that's so true, and this is like. What I find a lot of people is moksha, 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 moksha. I'm like, for me, I have no desire for moksha right now. I am happy with the, the path I'm following, whatever I'm doing. As long as I'm doing dharma, I don't care, right? Like, as long as I'm trying to be dharmic, the rest doesn't matter to me, right? This is, so, go ahead. So I have a, I have a, um, <laughs> so in my early 20s, when I was seriously spiritualizing and <laughs> starting my practice, um, even shortly after ha having met my teacher, I actually seriously considered renouncing the world. Yeah, I did too. When I was like, believe 19. it or not, I yeah. seriously, seriously considered it. Um, in retrospect, obviously, it's um, there's work to be done, right? Yeah, there's work to be done, and 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 being in the world but not of the world. I think there's this great wisdom there. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I, I totally agree. Um, I, I just feel this. There's just over emphasis on moksha where apparently moksha is super easy nowadays you just do xyz and there you are when it's considered the hardest thing in, in all of our texts like it's just it's it's, it's it is the most it, it, assuming the indian world classical hindu worldview yeah it is the most arduous undertaking a human can undertake right and, and the funny thing is also if you go down the path of bhakti, moksha is actually even thrown aside too. No, it's like we don't want moksha. We just want constant communion with 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 Bhagavan. You know, whether it's a thousand lifetimes, if you you know, like there's you know a lot of these uh, you know um, bhakti saints will say, I have no desire for moksha. Just have me born again and again, serving you on this world. It's 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 very similar, like. It's it's another way out of nirvrti. It's like back to nirvrti, nirvrti. Well, but but it's it, it, it's like okay, well, we're all in grade two and three, and maybe some of us are grade five and yeah. six, and we all are intent on finishing our, our doctoral dissertation this year. Yeah. And and the idea is is progress. The idea is where are you now? What are the life lessons you're called to learn now? Yeah. What are the patterns that are tripping you up now? What are the situations you continually attract now? Mm. How do you strategize out of where you are now? Not obsess about an ideal that is well beyond your grasp, despite the fact that you can download somebody's book online and apparently be enlightened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where are you now? Where are you now? And can you be further along your path, your vision of spirituality, your vision sure. of human perfection than, than you were yesterday? I think that is the fruit is in the lessons that are right in front of your face. And Prakriti is happy to send them your way. Right, right. And if you bypass the lessons of the school of life, what hope do you have of graduating? Oh, I agree. So let me ask you this question then. Um, so we've talked a little bit about, about karma and-, and Sure. Sex. Um, is, do you, th when it comes to the Mahat uh, Mahatmyam, do you think it is a text that's talking, do you think it, it I'm trying to rephrase this correctly. Let me put it this way. Um, is there free will or does karma determine everything? It, it, according to do you, the Devi Mahatmyam, do you think there is a sense? Because, I mean, the way I read, tend to read a lot of our, our texts is end up being like free will is kind of an uh, illusion of sorts and that we are all bundles of karma playing out the way we're playing. So how do you think that this text in particular addresses that issue? <laughs> I gave a talk last year called uh, Free Will and Karma. Hmm. Um, 
And I think much of what I had to say in that talk is probably relevant to your question. Are you more interested in what we see in the Devi Mahatmya? Or are you more interested in the question of um, free will versus destiny? Well, um, we can do both. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, I think what the Devi Mahatmya says we can start with and then maybe expand because, yeah, maybe that works. Okay. So the king's uh, power was stolen. Yeah. Him. Maybe we can say these are the forces of Daiva, destiny. And he is beside himself because he's like, I'm a good king. Like, what the hell? Hmm. And he goes into the forest and then he, 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 he takes solace in the presence of the sage at the ashrama. And uh, he's still sort of, what the hell? I can't stop these vasanas in my brain. Mm -hmm. I'm worried about a kingdom that I don't have. That's ridiculous. He meets the merchant. The merchant's also worried about money he no longer has. And the sage gives them initiation about Maya. You're all under the sway of Mahamaya. You're like these birds back and forth all day long. They think my baby will love me forever and ever. But as soon as they've sufficiently fed them, fledglings fly away. Mm. And they, they're basically expediting the departure of their beloveds. They're not securing human beings uh, beings in general like blocks of wood in the ocean right right they come together and they separate so so the sage gives them this teaching and then he tells them about the glory of the goddess and the sage says you know what maybe you should take refuge in the goddess this i've told you about her greatness she great she's booked you know she yeah. she grants liberation she grants enjoyment she grants kingship go and what happens do the king and the merchants sit on their laurels and wait for destiny to do his thing? No. No. They take action. They go and they worship her. They perform penance. And through their penance, they obtain a boon. You see? Mm -hmm. So clearly the text is indicating the significance of taking action and making decisions of your own accord. The Devi doesn't say you're destined to receive a boon. The Devi says, I am pleased, open bracket, by what you decided to do of your free accord, close bracket, mm -hmm. <laughs> by your penance. So clearly free will is validated in this text. What I would also say, and this I could, easily probably do an hour of a conversation on, but what I'll try to succinctly say is that the question of free will versus determinism is something that the conscious mind can't resolve because yeah. both are true and they work in tandem. And so uh, when you're looking at karmic theory, someone's uh, prarabdha karma is the karma that's ripening for them. Sure. But they're experiencing is the power of destiny. Destiny delivers their ripening karma. Right. But the ripening karma occurs because of actions that they undertook by virtue of their own free will. Right. So, and, yeah. and in the tandem of the ripening of destiny, you have the ability to act, to either make a bigger mess or clean up the mess you're in or do nothing. Right. Or whatever. So, so destiny and free will are both true and work in tandem in a way that can't fully be cognized. Right. Interesting. Because I take a different position than that. I take the position that free will doesn't exist in the way we think about free will because all we are are bundles of karma and basanas and samskaras controlled by our chitti and our... Mm -hmm. What does karma mean? Karma means, so this is where the Vedantic aspect comes in, right? This is where the idea that the Atma itself is not making decisions. Atma itself is not acting. The Atma is the Bokta, is the enjoyer, the- the Yes, the, yes, the, yes, the yes. One, the one that's sitting back observing it all. And yes, yes. The Maya yes. is that the Atma believes itself to be doing all these things, but all these things are Prakriti. They're happening, happening naturally because of the the flow of the trigunas and uh, the, 
the you know, all the vasanas and all these things are playing yes, out together. I understand. I understand exactly what you're saying. Let us focus on the prakriti. The problem yeah. is in the prakriti. Yes. Yes. And let's just focus from within the prakriti. Yeah. Within the prakriti, karma is generated by free action. Yes. But, so, but, but that's also where where Krishna's response in the Gita is Ishvara Sadrabhutanam. Right, I am spinning all beings around, and and this is why, like, it's beautiful in the Gita too, where he calls, where he says, you know, akala loka lokan, and and he ends up saying, uh, 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 Why does he use the name Savyasachin, right? Because Arjuna is dual-handed; each hand is like an instrument. So he's, and because each hand Arjuna treats like an instrument, Krishna is saying, "You are my instrument." Like from the perspective, I, from the perspective of the divine, yeah, there is no free will. Yeah, from the perspective of the individual, there most certainly is free will. So, so, so that's what I mean. And is, they're both happening. They're both real. Yes, yes. I will. I will say. If yes. you are not capable of free action, how could you possibly be accountable or responsible for your actions? Well, yeah, and this is where your perspective on saying this is in Prakriti, the Mahat, the Hamkara is the decision maker, even though it is part of Prakriti, it's, it's connected to karmic consequences, the way it is, it, it, the way it is in this particular well, life. Purusha doesn't fall under the sway of karma, if you want to use a Sankhya, like yeah, Purusha yeah. Or, the, or the Atman is beyond the sway of karma. Yeah, but it believes itself to be through uh, the Jiva Atman. yeah. Yeah, through the various koshas and all this other stuff, right? You end up in, in the situation where these entities think there are... The, 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 the Paramatman believes itself to be the Jivatman. But the Jivatman most certainly is under the sway of Prakriti. Oh, yeah. So, and this is where we'll end up having... Depends on your particular Sampradaya, right? Like with the... I, I, I'm much more like the Sri Vaishnavite Sampradaya, Vishnadvaita, or Kashmir Shaivism, where the, you know, um, you know Bhagavan isn't ever under Prakriti, it's always that... The, well, not Bhagavan, I'm talking about you and me and the other yeah, monkeys yeah. in this world. <laughs> yeah, but, 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 but we're always separated from Bhagavan, right? So that's like in these systems. We're always distinct attributes of Bhagavan. We're not like... There's no Kaivalya in, in, in these systems where where you merge and become... You, you lose the sense of oneness. What I mean to say is you, in your life, hmm. have made decisions of yeah, your own yes, free will. yes. And as have I. Yeah. So what I mean to say is that, and clearly, free will is a principle that is operating within the human experience. Right. But but then how do you deal with, like, for example, people like, you know, the neuroscience and Dan Dennett, right? I mean, it, it, this this stuff is interesting to me because I feel like how does the, the 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 karma theory and the free will theory deal with with modern scientific understanding of the way the subconscious works, the way we make decisions the way we engage with the world based upon our conscious versus unconscious mind right like like scientific i mean these studies show that more often than not i mean most of the time 99 percent of the time your unconscious is acting before you even know you're doing something so how does that play in the mix in the mix in what sense like we're not actually consciously deciding anything most of the time it's already being decided by in the back we, of our we are we are not People are propelled by vasanas. Yeah, yeah. Those vasanas are unconscious. Yes. So a man is looking for a partner, whether a woman, a man, one of each, whatever. Sure. A person, a purusha. Yeah. <laughs> is looking for a partner. Yeah. And consciously they're looking for a partner. Unconsciously, they're sabotaging it. Unconsciously, oh, they forget to respond to the email. Uh, the body language or the messages you're saying, I'm not available. Because right. they're, they're consciously looking, but they're unconsciously afraid of commitment. So what this is, is that they are consumed by Prakriti. Right. Th right? Sure. They are mechanistic and you can predict what they'll do. They're not able to break the pattern. They are, they are a slave to the pattern. Right. Because they're propelled by Prakriti. Now, for an individual, so if you're coaching an individual and you're facilitating them breaking the pattern, what you're facilitating is 
of the awareness and the strength to harness their free will to overpower the unconscious vasana. Mm. Okay. To break the pattern. And that requires chitta, that requires consciousness. So whether people come to me for consciousness or not, whenever we help them with the bullshit of their lives, and we all have bullshit lives, yeah, whenever yeah. they break a pattern, they always become more conscious. Mm. Mm. Okay. Because the chitta shakti and the kriya shakti, they're just aspects of the same, Atman. Yeah, yeah, right? yes, yes. So, so, so the more conscious an individual is, on this level within Prakriti, yeah, the more they are able to act freely, free of their patterning, yeah, right. So that is the power. So it's the it's the free will, right? Taken to its extreme, free will is moksha. You're fully free. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but that's from the level of the purusha again, where it's already been free. It just now sees itself again as free because it's not looking at itself vis-a-vis Prakriti. It's just seeing itself. And it's not I understand your perspective. In my experience, that doesn't help people become better people. No, you're right. No, no. I, 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 so, it, no, what, what I mean to say is I understand your perspective entirely and, yeah. and I, I respect it fully. What I'm saying is um, we can't have a conference of self-realized souls if we're not self-realized. No, I, I, so I agree with you. So I, 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 100% on board where I think like free will is a total reality within Prakriti as in a conventional reality in the way Shankara uses Vyabhara uh, in, yes. his, in his world. Right? So, so from the perspective of that philosophy, we have the illusion of free will. Yes. But from the perspective of the Maya in which we live, free will is as real as this table 100%. is as 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 everything else is and yeah. so this is so yes yeah, so it's, it's a question of perspective yeah so i mean that to me is uh it's so empowering in so many ways isn't it like it's both empowering even if you believe yourself to be like just the consequence of karma that's empowering for me in many ways where i start looking at the world is i don't have control i just need to i need there, to accept and move with it there is profound wisdom well, in many places. Yeah. Uh, but there's profound wisdom in the serenity prayer. Profound when you think yeah. about it. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Yeah. Please help me to deal with my product or whatever the hell it is, because yeah, I can't yeah. do anything about it. Yeah, yeah. I can't have a partner for 20 years. So be it. Ansi Swatil. Uh, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. God grant me the courage, the vidium, the will to change yeah. the things I can. You don't need to have diabetes. It's not your parapta. It's your kriya yeah. karma. Get on the treadmill. Yeah, yeah. Whatever, right? To right. change the key things I can. And the hardest part is the third line. The Viveka, God grant me the wisdom to know the difference. In my humble opinion, people spend so much time exerting so much shakti on things they cannot change yeah. and they make so many excuses to not deal with the things that they can i totally on board there i uh for me it's just i totally agree i think you're 100 right i i focus mostly on like i can't change anything i so i just do whatever i little i can in my own head to to address it you know it's it's uh i can't change people's feelings i can't change people how people are going to interact with me i can't change how the world is i'm accepting of it it, it gives me a great comfort to accept it all it's so it, it it i i don't get angry that often anymore where before i'd be like oh why don't you why don't you believe me why don't you listen to me i'm like fine you don't want to listen you go your path enjoy you know you'll come back some other time so detachment has come yeah, in some sense. I mean, obviously, there's some level of attachment you have to be, I mean, to engage in the world. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, I think I've convinced a few other people, not me. Again, I don't think I convinced anyone. I think there's just their mind finds a particular idea and they, they assign to it. But it's just, it's a beautiful, I mean, both these ideas are incredibly beautiful of, of ways to engage with the world. If taken properly, it's never, but either way, it should never be like Krishna says again, it should never be a case of not doing anything, right? It should never be a case of just uh, um, deciding not to act. Whether you, whether you believe in karma or not, act. Yoga Thakur Karmani. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, that's Kuru. right. Kuru Karmani. He's commanding him 
Go. Just ask. So within the realm of the Kurukshetra, yeah, the Kurukshetra, yeah, <laughs> which, which is hilarious. Within the field of Kuru, yeah, he's saying yoga stuck. Kuru, he's saying go act. Yeah. However illusory it might be to me, it's real to you. And if you don't harness your free will, you're going to make a big bloody mess. Yeah, of of everything, right? Yeah. <laughs> But this is great. You're right. The field of Kuru, they're both code of us. They're both actors on both sides. <laughs> Just act. <laughs> um, it, it, I mean, like the etymol- when you start learning what these words mean and you look at it from like multiple angles, it's, it's brilliance. Oh my God. The narrative brilliance is just overwhelming. Well, the narrative has the power to uh, say multiple things at the same time. Yeah. Right. That's, the, that's that's one of the great powers of narrative. And it also has the power to teach you when you least expect it because it's not preaching. It's it's just, um, you can just be, it's not taking out the sword and starting to fence with you. It's yeah. just showing you, it's telling you a story and then you could take what you want from the story. And not just, um, and that's exactly how the, the stories of the, the Mahabharata work for the, for the interlocutors. Where, where um, Mark and Dea is like, well, you think you got a rock, do you, son? Let me tell you the story of Rama. <laughs> yeah, but that's, so my cousin and I were talking about this and I noticed him with his, with his daughter, I mean, his wife with, with their daughter, she starts crying. And then they're like, they're like, Lalita, you want to hear a story? She just stops, right? And then like, but, but this is like, what, even with this show, like, oh my, woe is me, woe is me. You know, instead of, instead of giving him like, oh, you should not feel sorry for yourself. It's, you know what? Let me tell you a story. Listen to a story. And then suddenly like the preachiness goes away. The, the story takes over and it changes you. And like, it's beautiful. I mean, wow. Because a story is not encoding information. It is, but it is showing you a transformation. So the the path of the protagonist, the path of the characters, there is a transformation of the consciousness within right. that story. And when you, it, this is why when you have a great story, whether it's a film or a, a novel or a Purana, even though you know what's going to happen in the end, yeah. you read it over and over again because it's taking you on that journey, right? Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. I mean, even even conversations like this, right? Like if we're trying to, if I'm trying to convince you of a position, you're more recalcitrant. You're going to sit there and be like, no, I, I'm not going to. But if I tell you my life experience and those, and those viewpoints are in there, you're more likely to, to connect and like, let it go. Like, this is why I think like people trying to prove other people wrong. Well, you're, you're racist because X, Y, Z doesn't make sense because people won't see themselves that way. But if you tell a story how, for example, you have dealt with something, that shifts them in a little bit, right? Well, they're just sitting, right? If I if I tell a story about feeling like an outsider yeah, and going through a journey and how difficult it was that a, a man who was gifted with great intelligence thought he was too dumb for a, <laughs> for a BA, it's not yeah. me. That's just the, 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 I was given this. I'm not boasting i'm saying i was gifted with this right but i had this idiotic thought that i couldn't do a ba so i left school because of the social issues and they're listening because you're not blaming anyone for anything right you're just sharing the perspective you're giving them insight into the human experience yeah and that's right? the power of narrative right it's so amazing like i just can't get over something this magical it, it really is like magic it, to me like narratives is magic it's because it just works at almost every level. Well, they're, they are they are the most profound ways of pedagogy, not just for an individual, but for a civilization, for a culture. Nothing holds or, 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 or helps to craft a zeitgeist or an ethos or an imaginaire like story. This is where, this is the work of culture. That's yeah. why the stories that we believe in, the stories we hold into, they, they, um, they, they bind us unconsciously to certain values and ways of seeing. Yeah. And understanding the stories that guide our civilization. This is why the Mahabharata is called the Mahabharata. It's telling you the story of a people and the values they're in. It's really, it's, um, it's, it's sort of stitching the ethos of what we think of as classical Hinduism. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like, I, I, I mean, 
until we told stories, none of us, I mean, we weren't human beings, right? We were, we were just like any other animal. And the storytelling ability really brought us out into, into fullness of, of what we are. And I think that's, uh, it's beautiful. And I, I love that you're, you're bringing that out in your, in your work and the focus. I wish there were more people like you doing more, more uh, narrative engagement focusing on truths of the story, what the story, the, the message of, of, of these texts and how they're going about doing it, because even the method they're doing it is, I, I, I many ways I find to be brilliant and innovative. Yeah, there, there is some, um, it's difficult to crack the nut of a story though, at times to, to consciously see what it's doing. Yeah. So it's understandable why someone would rather enjoy the story or study, uh, study something else, but studying a story, you're, you're kind of switching between being in the story and then observing the story. So I understand why it's not always the easiest fit to be a scholar of story, right? Because scholarship and storytelling involve different aspects of self. Yes, yes, right? Um, but it's awesome. Um, I know we're, we're hitting upon like the two and a half hour mark here. So um, what, are, what, else are you, what else you got going on? I mean, uh, right now, like what are you working on? What's, what's coming up? I, what's coming up? I'm creating a course for the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies on the Hindu goddess. That'll be fun. That won't be up for good, uh, probably towards the end of the year. But I have currently, I've started two private courses this week. One is called the Hindu Tapestry. It's an intro to, to Indian religions. There's one coming up in a couple of days called Faces of Power. It's a course on on, on the Devi, on, on Lakshmi, on Kali, on Durga. Mm -hmm. um, and the great thing about the courses I do on the private platform is, you know, while they're responsible and rigorous and I harness, I leverage my academic training, I have license to be soulful. I have license to share uh, insights and, and life wisdom in a way that may not be quite appropriate in an academic setting or even a continuing study setting. So people can go to rajbalkorn.com and see my current courses. There's also a scholarship tab um, where they can actually just download articles, like the, like the article on the Markani Puran and the Mahabharata, the article on, um, on, 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 on the Devi fulfilling Vishnu's role. Yeah. Uh, so that's pretty much it. I teach online courses. I do a bunch of one-on-one -on -one life coaching work and um, uh, ideally find the time to write um, articles, not so much in the last semester, but hey, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe the next. I mean, that's you got a lot going on and I, I you know like you've talked about this before but i think it's really interesting how much online training online schooling online education has become uh so powerful in the past especially past year you know i think you you've been on like the cusp of of that for quite a while um is it is it is it something you can speak on as to you know outside of the apparent benefits of, 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 of being able to take a class anywhere. Where do you think online education is going to sit going forward, in, you know, post pandemic, you know, is it going to be something more that universities and, you know, reputable universities like Oxford and University of Toronto are going to be doing more of, or is it going to be back to regular business? Um, without question, much of the online initiatives will stay, not all of them, because there is something to be said about face-to-face -face learning and, and real-time conferences. Yeah. But nevertheless, um, if I had to have them a guess, I'd say a good number of university courses will remain online. Yeah. Um, and the universities, uh, I feel that we are living through a profound transformation that we're not gonna understand for a hundred years. Um, and part of that is exasperated by the pandemic and people connecting online. Um, so I don't think online education is going anywhere. I think that now that the academy was forced online because of the pandemic, mm -hmm. it's no longer sort of the B list or it's no longer low brow. Now you can take a, a, a course with a reputable scholar online and it opens up possibilities for others to join. Um, so I think, I think it'll be a mainstay. I think podcasts and online learning will only grow in coming years as we experience the, the labor pains of birthing a globe. You know? Right, right. Um, do you have any other, outside of those projects you're working on, do you have anything else that's uh, um, big on, any other podcasts you go on, any other shows that, that you're planning to launch? 
Uh, no, as for the podcasting, just the new books in Indian religions. Um, oh, actually, no, you must have, you must be psychic. I forgot, but I do want to start a podcast, but I don't know what it is yet. <laughs> so hold off on, <laughs> but I've been asked a number of times and I'd like to start. I, I don't want to give up. The, I have no desire. I want to continue the service to the academic yeah. community. Right. But I want a podcast where I'm not necessarily restricted to someone's publication mm. I want like yourself the free range of motion to engage someone about their life so there's some podcasts sort of in the back of my brain that has to be churned out sometime later this year right other than that really uh, my life is uh, tons of one-on-one life consulting life coaching work scholarship um, and online teaching teaching courses different platforms that's pretty much it Okay, awesome. Uh, is there any other topic that you think that we didn't touch upon uh, that you think we should, or uh, are we uh, tapped out for right now? <laughs> no, I think it's always the journey, right? Um, yeah. I, I would, no, I think we touched on, I didn't really have a particular agenda. I, I think that, I think we touched on pretty much everything that that would be appropriate for sure. for the podcast. I would say that I really encourage people to engage narrative texts, yeah. uh, Sanskrit narrative texts uh, in particular. But I would engage people to in, to 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 I would encourage people to engage narrative texts through the lens of what we can learn, not necessarily about India or Hinduism. Hmm. But what we can learn about ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Right. That is a very powerful maneuver. And I think it'd be very useful for people. Absolutely. Um, if people want to reach out to you, where can they find you? And how do they reach out? Rajbalkaran.com. That's where you can find pretty much everything, the scholarship, the coaching, the online courses. There's a contact form there. Okay. So please, by all means, um, reach out if you're interested in some of the curriculum that's being offered or even ideas for future curriculum. I'm always open to creating new courses. Um, really anything. If you think I could be of service, whether one-on-one, whether teaching, whether a scholarly collaboration, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm open to connecting with others as I continue to figure out what my dharma is in this world. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, uh, thank you so much for your time. I, you know, uh, Professor Balkar, this is amazing. I, you know, I had great, Great, great time. Learned a lot. Not only reading your book and your articles, but listening to your new books uh, in Hindu studies, but now new books in Indian religions. Uh, I, I, I totally, I learned so much from you and it's, it's you're inspiring. So thank you so much for everything. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you for the work that you do. Um, one quick thing I'll say before I go is sure. very quick. Why did you name the podcast the way you named it? Meru. I named it Meru because um, Meru is connected to everything in all worlds. Um, and it's connected to Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, and Sikhism. So it, I wanted it to be where we can discuss any of these traditions and anything connected to these traditions um, and connected to the modern world, you know, it, it was, it's very all encompassing and it, and it has the, the vision of being central to the universe is really why. Great. Yeah. Um, may I share sort of the mythic significance of Meru in my yeah, brain? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, the, uh, probably apropos to what you're doing, but the two dimensions that come to mind that I think are quite, um, uh, quite engaging is, you know, Meru was the churning pole. Probably one of the most powerful narratives I've ever come across yeah. is the churning of the ocean, right? Yeah. Where dark and light have to come together. Yeah. Um, 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 there's so much there. The, 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 the birth of Rahu, um, the birth of Lakshmi. There's just yeah. so, so, so much there. But, but the axis around which all that takes place is Meru. So, yeah. so to, to be a still point in all the churning that, you know, the, the churning of ideas or the churning of opinions can yeah. be there. And to be a platform that that is open to the churning, that's really uh, cool. And the other piece that really resonates is um, Meru as an axis mundi, mm. as a point, uh, 
uh, a point through which heaven and earth meet. Right, right. right? And this idea of um, um, religious mythic uh, ideas being brought down into mundane um, academic social discourse. And I think... I Absolutely. I mean, I appreciate that. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we have another series where we deal with uh, other religious traditions and we call that Meru Manthan, <laughs> the, the churning of the Meru, because we bring on people from Judaism, Christianity, um, we're trying to get people from Islam to talk about their traditions, our traditions, the points of difference, points of uh, similarities, and, and just kind of like engage and, and do that churn, the dance that is oh. helpful. May the journey continue, and thank you for having me on your podcast. Thank you so much. Push pasul gal de sumalaya samire pavana muni jana yamuna tire pavana muni jana yamuna tire gayati vanamali. Gayati vanamali maduram Gayati vanamali